Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And we got a very cool, very special, and very talented guest for us today with Michael Beinhorn, of course, a great producer hey. of uh, so many records like uh, that are in all of our favorites list. I'm going to give you a quick uh, bio on Michael in a second. Just want to thank our mutual friend, Joby Ford from the Bronx for hooking us up. Thanks, Joby. Thank you, Joby. Uh, Michael Beinhorn, incredibly successful record producer. I wrote that. He don't. He didn't put that in like his bio. <laughs> I'm an incredibly. He's an incredibly. It's my writing. A successful record producer, composer, author, and musician. Uh, honestly, his list of credits is so long it would be impossible for me to fit all of them on one page. So I'm going to talk about, let alone even one tenth of them probably. So here's a limited list of some of the artists he's worked with: Brian Eno, Nile Rodgers, David Byrne, Whitney Houston. Uh, Michael also played on and co-wrote Herbie Hancock's massive hit Rocket. He produced Fab Five Freddy's Change the Beat. Uh, Nona Hendrix. Did you work with Ronnie Drayton? Do you know Drayton? Do you know him? Did you know he, him? Yeah, he was on my show here. Yeah, he passed like six months after he was on my show. Yeah, I was shocked by that. That just came in from out of the blue. Yeah, yeah. I figured you'd work with him. Uh, oh, yeah. Lenny White, Violent Femmes, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Ozzy Osbourne, Aerosmith, Soundgarden, Soul Asylum, Marilyn Manson, Living Color, uh, Social Distortion, Whole, Corn, and he worked on the number two Billboard record from Corn, uh, Untouchables, it went platinum, Fuel, The Bronx, of course, Africa Bombada, The Pet Shop Boys, Janet Jackson, The Cult, Black Label Society, literally hundreds of others. Uh, his projects have combined record sales of over 45 million copies worldwide. And he's the only record producer in history to have two separate recordings debut in the Billboard Top 10 in the same week. That was Marilyn Manson, Mechanical Animals at number one, and Holes, Celebrity Skin at number nine. Over the last 20 years, Michael's focused on providing remote, cost-effective solutions for record production, pre-production, and artist development, and he's created the world's first fully remote production service. He's got a, a very cool book called Unlocking Creativity, where he discusses creative approaches to record production, and the book also applies to really systematized processes in other in other areas outside of music and he's actually doing work in them and we'll talk about that as well uh he's also an active voice regarding the problems facing both artists and producers who are trying to maintain a creative voice and their ethics in the current music business climate man thank you so much i really appreciate your time do you do pr <laughs> no but i've been in marketing for 20, 20 something years so it's sort of like that a, was good a natural thank you <laughs> excellent <laughs> summation <laughs> that was hard. That was the toughest part of this. Like, uh, what do I put in? What do I take out? Um, all right. Early on, you and bassist Bill Laswell formed a band called Material. The genre was called No Wave. And I had never heard of that. And I listened to a bunch of it. Um, it was kind of like early improvisational electronica. Um, it's, I guess no wave is sort of like, it, it was a category that was attached. Like, like, I never thought that we were a no wave band per se. Right. Like, no wave, no wave is bands like eight eyed spy and James white and the contortions. And, uh, you know, they, they were, they were a little noisier than we were. Yeah. Like what we did was kind of, um, it was a combination of like avant-garde jazz and funk and some electronics thrown in like it was sort of a, a it was an interesting blend of elements yes um yeah <laughs> um definitely like in the early stages but there was a lot of a lot of really cool things happening and it was so early that there was a lot of people throwing stuff against the wall and trying to see if it stuck and you know some of it stuck some of it didn't <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know we i I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 frankly, I found the no way bands a little bit more interesting. <laughs> 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 the, there was kind of, there was this kind of like crazy ferocious energy to what they did and they would get violent too. Like they would take people out of the audience and just beat the living shit out of them. Are you stuff. serious? <laughs> well, some would, a lot of them just kind of had like an attitude of like, don't get near me, you know? Wow. Imagine you come home all beat up and your mom's like, what happened? No, I just went to a concert. It was, it was great. Well, come on, man. That was New York in like the late seventies anyway. Uh, right. You know? 
You right. walk into a club like CBGB's or something like that. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's very <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, before we get into a bunch of the cool projects you've worked on, I just want to talk a little bit about your early years. We talked that you grew up in the city. That's right. Yeah. Where, whereabouts? I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Spent my life, spent a, a good part of my life there and then discovered Manhattan and that was it. Yeah, same thing happened to me, man. Bye, bye, uh, Queens. Where yeah. are you from? I'm from the Bronx. Oh, okay. So it was the same thing. I'd be in the city on the weekends, you know, just hop yeah. on. But I, you, had, I had to take a bus to the train. That was a pain in the ass. But it was, you know, what am I going to do? The Bronx is pretty miserable in the '70s, especially. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Did Did you ever? Were you always going to be involved with music as a career, or did like did you consider doing something else at one point? Uh. Well, early on, I was an illustrator. Like, I just got into drawing, and I was never, academics was never my strong suit. So it wasn't the kind of thing where I, I had much opportunity or choice in that department. Uh, you know, I, I left high school with a GED. And initially, my, my thought was, excuse me, I'm going to get into illustration. Like, the thing that I wanted to do, interestingly enough, is was medical illustration, which is kind of an arcane. Yeah, I was going to ask, thing. yeah, what is that, <laughs> man? I didn't even know what that was. An anatomical illustration. I mean, the people you can find books on it now, mm -hmm. and you know some of the people who did it, it, like it's really treated more like artwork. But as far as like, I think a serious way to analyze what's going on in the body with computer graphics, you're so far ahead of that. Mm. So you don't even need a. Uh, you don't even need like a drawn visual representation. So you have serious arcana, but that's kind of what I was drawn to, you know, which is, I think that kind of gives you some insight into my character. <laughs> that yeah, I'm like yeah. a small, ch like a kid that's interested in medical illustration. This is definitely someone who's a little bit off the beaten path. <laughs> yeah, but that's, a, you know, the other thing that surprised me is, you know, early on we talked, I said, I think I said to you something like, you know, you're super intelligent. I have to really be on my toes and I'm talking to you. And then you're telling me you, you left high school with a GED. So you've obviously like self-educated yourself tremendously through reading and whatever, you know, whatever else you've used over the years. Yeah, I think it's what people call an idiot savant, but the emphasis <laughs> on idiot, I think. <laughs> no, but you obviously were, you weren't a, school wasn't your thing that structure but the pursuit of learning and curiosity obviously was in your makeup yeah and it still is you know yeah. I, there's a lot out there that you know, come on i mean who's gonna who's gonna ever know like even a fraction of all the world's knowledge you know That's not possible yeah so experience and do everything that you can while you're alive to just you know to just experience you know, to, to, to just see it you know, it's incredible. <clears throat> so I, I, I found myself interested in things that other people just weren't interested in. Right. So, so how did you jump from drawing and, and, you know, medical illustration to music? Like was your family musical or your parents musical or? My folks really love music. Um, my mom was a, was a singer and a pianist and, uh, she still is from time to time. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I was exposed to music from a really young age. So I listened to a lot. It was it wasn't a very large variety because my folks were kind of orthodox as to what they would allow in the house. Like they weren't into any kind of like poppy, you know, rock and roll type stuff. I mean, the, the Beatles were definitely like, yeah, sure. You know, but just about anything else. Like my mom hated the Rolling Stones for some reason. I cannot figure out why. Mm. So stuff like that was you know, couldn't listen to it. Um, <laughs> so that all, that all came later on. <clears throat> but my, my grandparents had a record by Walter Carlos, who's now Wendy, um, called Switched on Bach. Okay. And when I heard that and saw the cover, I was like, what in the holy hell is this? Like, it just blew my mind because that was the first time I was exposed to the uh, Moog synthesizer. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously on the cover of someone who's dressed up 
like Bach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I saw this thing and I was like, how are they doing that? Like the idea of sonics and sounds was fascinating to me. This is what I love. And in some ways, I mean, neck and neck with music itself, mm. but the idea of sound creation and things like that. So my obsession from that point forward was to own a synthesizer and to play with it. Okay. So eventually the interest ran neck and neck. Obviously you need to have a lot more resources when you're little to get a synthesizer, than you, <laughs> to, you know, to get like a pad and, you know, and, and a pencil and like, and do a drawing. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the means eventually came my way to actually purchase a little synthesizer and it, cha it just changed my life completely. That was it. Okay. Now the dime just dropped on all the work you did in material. Yeah. Yeah. Now it makes sense. Okay. Uh, so what was your childhood? What was your childhood like? Normal pretty much or weird or New York city regular? I'm pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's up to you if you want to elaborate on that. <laughs> you know, like the normal sort of like sixties dysfunctional upbringing. Yeah. Okay. Which you hasn't know. changed. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I suppose not. No, you know, it's, it was one of those tight things, you know. Um, but it's interesting because I think those kinds of upbringings are, are they're strangely, they're strangely helpful in some respects if it's the right kind, the right kind of wrong, if that yeah. makes any sense. You know, because well, it's really you got that, it, it, I, I'm sorry, I was just going to add in, if you have that personality that can weather that and look beyond it, yes, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of, it calcified everything that was in me. Like it kind of, I think I became so, uh, I don't know, set in, in, the, in, in the path that I was on that it was like, okay, you know, if you're going to, if I'm going to get that kind of like pushback from my, from my family, then I'm, excuse me, I'm sticking with this for sure. You know, right. and yeah. you're talking about someone who's very young kind of being like, that's it. That's what I'm doing. Forget it. Right. <laughs> so that's that, that forged your path, you know, turned a, you know, uh, what do you call it? What is it? Rock into diamond on, you know, in that direction. Well said. Okay. All right. Now I want to just start talking about some of the stuff you've done again, sort of chronologically. You produced, co-wrote and played on Rocket, which was Herbie Hancock's massive hit. How the hell did you move from being a band member playing totally non-mainstream stuff? I mean, really esoteric stuff and doing production work and material to doing <laughs> production, writing and playing with Herbie Hancock. Do you want the long answer? Do you want the longer answer? <laughs> <laughs> the long um, one. <laughs> well, <laughs> this thing is, is that like, I, I discovered something very interesting. Like, and if you're fortunate enough to get, I guess, die stamped into what it is that, you, that you've been sort of like put here for, Right. And I, I, I apologize for getting somewhat spiritual. No, please um, <laughs> do, because I'm super interested in like how people think about that, because I think you're right. When you're put when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it works. This is it. And if you do what you're supposed to be doing, even if there's a certain amount of like unpleasantness and suffering that's involved in the process, if you don't break away from the single minded kind of focus of this is i'm here i'm doing this i'm here i'm doing this i'm going to continue doing this i can't stop you know and if for that matter you, you know you look around you and you're kind of i mean for me it was kind of like i don't know what else i would do and it was sort of like a panic i suppose you know but there's also kind of like a i can't imagine doing anything else i wouldn't want to do anything else like i just i wasn't made to do anything else sure. you know and I, my entire life revolved around this work and around this idea. And so I went from someone who was essentially a novice who knew absolutely, I had a synthesizer, but I knew very little about it. 
Right. You know, I, I eventually learned, of course, but, you know, all of a sudden I do this, I, I go straight into this band, you know, I start this band with this guy, Laswell, and a couple of other guys, um, Fred Moore and Cliff Coltrary. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, like things just started to happen. And I mean, stuff doesn't just happen. I mean, obviously there's effort. You're in motion. Behind all of it. Yeah, everyone's in, everyone's in motion. Everyone's doing what they do. And I just kind of gravitated toward what I was best at. And things, it's amazing how things will formulate out of the ether and just come at you. And all you have to do at that point, once you've created enough energy around yourself, is to say yes. You know, just to be like, okay, that looks good. So enough things happened. The timing was right. You know, again, these are all things I feel that when you find, you know, when you find yourself in agreement with who and what you are, the, everything else around you kind of orients itself to that mindset. Yeah. You know, because after all, what is life, but essentially a reflection of our perception of, it. I mean, the point can be argued either, you know, for and against, but my experience is that life orders itself you know, or in orient direct orientation with what your perception of it is. I, I tend to see that people who are miserable all the time are surrounded by really, really unfortunate circumstance. I mean, that's not to say that, that none of us is going to, anyone who's got like a completely positive outlook isn't going to have something terrible, you know, terrible things happen to them. This is this part of like the, the, the way life is. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't exist without it. It's like, okay, something awful happened. What am I going to do with it? That's the difference. Right. You know, and for that matter, if you're going to take it a step further, how can I learn from this? What can I do? What can I gain from this to make me a better person and to be even better at what it is that I do and hopefully be better in the world with other people? <clears throat> I'm, I'm so, so with you on everything you just said. In fact, I go one step further. I, other thing I try to do is say, what was my responsibility in this? Because sometimes the universe just gives you some shit. And it's like, absolutely. But I'm always like, what did I do? Because I don't want to fucking do it again. <laughs> well, but, you know? but also, but it teaches, but also having that kind of mindset. Yes. I agree with you hundred percent is, is, is to kind of, is to learn, you know? Yeah. And to, you know, and to recognize what it's not, it's not only what I did because that can also, you know, if you're only going to go so far with it, you're going to examine the superficial aspects of what it was that you did. But what motivated you to do what you did? You know, that's that's you know, the, that's yeah. where the the yeah, man. Oh, this is great. We're 15 minutes into this, and we're fucking <laughs> way down into the. This is great, man. No, no I agree what life's with you. About. Yeah, I agree. That's what life's about. Yeah. The thing is, is that when you get to that point, then you start to go into like the real ugly stuff inside of yourself. You know that you're you're willing to kind of look far beyond, like the oh, I shouldn't do this again. To kind of like all right, we're going to go on a journey now. We're going deep inside. I may not like what I see. In fact, I know I probably won't, but it's like, <laughs> it's there and we got to look at it. I'm you know? so with you. Yeah, man. I really, really believe in that. Yeah. But it's a, that's also a beautiful part of life. I mean, that's a great thing, you know? So, uh, now you weren't able to I, do this when you were like, and this wasn't your thought process when you were twenties. I don't think though, was it? Oh, hell no. I was a fucked yeah. up little kid. <laughs> I'm like, holy no, this shit. Is... I just stopped. I'm like, man, it took me like 50 something years to like evolve to that. I'm like, is this guy doing this in his 20s? <laughs> hell no. No, this is the, come on. I'd be president by now. <laughs> <laughs> king, king of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> nah, I, you know, this is, this is, you know, reflecting back, yeah. you know, and hopefully with some degree of, of wisdom, Hmm. uh you know or whatever you want to call it no that's a good word that's a good word <laughs> yeah but like things just happen yeah you know things just happen we were doing the right thing in the right place at the right time you know totally. and we got noticed you know we were making records people heard our records people who heard our records some of them played on some of our records some of them, like Nona, asked us to produce her record. You know, um, Herbie had come to 
Bill Laswell and our drummer Fred Moore to ask them to play on a solo record that he was working on. And that never materialized, <laughs> pardon the pun. And it so, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> totally accidental. Um, that evaporated and uh, dematerialized. Um, <laughs> but I'm both. And, you know, so we, so we kind of forgot about it. Uh, Fred, Fred left the band. And then all of a sudden, uh, Herbie's um, assistant, this guy, Tony Myland, came to him came to uh, us and Herbie was on his last record for Sony. Like they were literally going to give him the boot after this. Okay. This was going to be his last record. So this is kind of like the, I got nothing to lose moment. Yeah. You know, again, like how could you possibly be in a better place than this? Yeah. And he's like, you know, all of a sudden it's not about getting the rhythm section to play in Herbie's record. It's like, could you write two songs? Could you come up with two ideas for Herbie's next record? And we're like, could we? <laughs> Maybe you should be asking us if we want to pay you for the privilege. <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. You know, and and that's, you know, that's pretty much how, how it happened. It was, but this was a time when you could do stuff like this, when the, when the road was free and clear. I mean, I think that people in the music industry were so confused by all the changes that were taking place. You know, and also the, the music industry was kind of coming out of a massive slump. You know, you remember like in the seventies, there was a tremendous downturn. I mean, there was an economic downturn too, but people started buying less records. Yeah. You know, there was a major depression in the music industry. That was when like the home taping is killing music campaign happened. If you know? they only knew. <laughs> uh, if they only knew. <laughs> and, uh, you know so cds kind of like start to kick income back up again but the people in the music industry were like they they were kind of like wait these formulas that we have aren't working you know how are we going to make records again so they were sort of caught off guard and in this moment it was possible for people like us to kind of come in to be to be looked at as like wait they're doing something interesting because at that point doing something interesting was was on was sort of like on a par with doing something that makes a lot of money, which is crazy to think about it, right? But well, yeah, I, I mean, because, yeah, yeah. Because of that, people took us seriously. Like now, it would be a whole different thing. We'd be languishing in like a, you know, in a <laughs> squat someplace, with no electricity, <laughs> making music with like cardboard boxes and wood. <laughs> so, you, did you have like these? How did the would it how did Rocket come about? I mean, did you have these pre i programmed ideas or like ex, how did this thing come to fruition? Because it was a well, major major hit, and it was you know everybody knows that song from the video. It was just great. It's kind of left field. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we got we'd start to get interested in hip hop, you know, which was a music form that was relatively new. Mm -hmm. uh, you know it. And people in the mainstream were were becoming acclimatized to it because you had, you know, a bunch of records like Planet Rock and The Message and Numbers by Kraftwerk and The Magnificent Seven by The Clash, you know, like that were that were they weren't mainstream, but they were they were records that were doing very well in their respective areas. Yes. And you know, so people were gradually being introduced to this. But no one had done anything with it yet, or it kind of cracked the mainstream. Now that this was not our this was not our goal at all to crack the mainstream. Our right. goal was to make a really, really groundbreaking record with a, with a famous jazz fusion artist. Not even groundbreaking. I mean, we weren't we weren't looking at at it like that. Like to us, there were no accolades in this at all. Yeah, I, I, you did it for the pure love of the joy of creating something cool. Well, Herbie was like our guinea pig. He was our lab rat, you know, like, no, I mean, I, I don't mean that in a bad way either, but it was like, he was offered to us in a silver platter. It was like, what can you do for this guy? And it's like, holy crap, really? Yeah, this is like, the... yeah, this is like giving like a kid the key to a great big candy store with mm. no one to supervise him saying, yeah, just go and have fun. Yeah. You know, so we we're like, oh, shit. Um, so 
over the past like year, year and a half, we've been actually more than that because we did a bunch of records um, for this record, this label called Celluloid that changed the beat one being one of them, which are hip hop, you know, uh, change the beat also incorporated this, the world famous fresh sample. Right. Um, which I, it, I'm assuming you're familiar with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was created on that record. That's amazing, um, man. Yeah. I, that was you I created that. That was me. That's right. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so we were, we weren't exactly, I wouldn't say we were hip hop artists, but we made hip hop records with hip hop artists, you know, so we kind of understood a little bit about the genre, at least at that particular point in time. So we were kind of like, okay, we applied, I guess, our ideas from, you know, more conceptual ways of looking at music production, which is let's visualize a kind of rich, like a, a, um, a kind of like revisionist history where Herbie never made any of the pop records that he made. And he still continued being this sort of groundbreaking jazz fusion composer who had records like Watermelon Man and Chameleon and stuff like that and had his time with Miles Davis. You know, so if he stayed on that same trajectory, what would happen? What would he do if he heard hip hop music? If these two paths intersected like that what would happen i mean because this is a guy in his experimental state as a jazz fusion artist who's just looking for new things to try he was one of the first jazz performers who embraced electronics and synthesizers you know i mean one of the greatest thrills i ever got when i was younger was seeing a performance of him, him performing with with headhunters on public on, on pbs and Channel he's got 13. this great big yeah, he's got the right exactly. <laughs> Channel 13. Yeah, masterpiece theater. Um, <laughs> right. So he's playing on stage with this ARC 2600, which is like, you know, for, for me, that was like, oh, I want one, <laughs> you know. But he's on stage with this jazz fusion band playing this instrument. I'm like, oh, you know, like th nowadays you see something like that and it's like, oh, wow, back then, so cool, you know. But <laughs> this is, you know, in, in the moment when I saw it, that yeah. was like a, a moment, like modern times, contemporary, fresh, like there's Herbie Hancock, you know, with these guys, these enormous afros, you know, playing this, you know, with the, with the percussion, playing these like funk grooves. And he's got this synthesizer, like that just fucked me up. Right. <laughs> and this is this, you know, so we're envisioning the same guy now, what's he doing? What's he thinking? What's he coming up with? How's he being inspired when he meets hip hop, right? Wow. So you actually thought you had a, that's a lot of, yes. that's very deliberate. It was not, it was not random. I mean, you had a path in mind to set off on. It wasn't, it wasn't random at all. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one of the things that made it so fun because if you have a, a you know, an, an ethos, you know, some kind of credo to work, some kind of set of rules or, you know, a, 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 a I guess, yeah, manifesto, whatever, yeah. at least for the project to work from, you can visualize what it is that you're trying to create. You can right. see it in your mind's eye. You, you can hear it almost what it sounds like, you know, and electro hip hop was very, very popular at that point because of Planet Rock. And of course, Planet Rock comes from craft work. You know, so we can see like the historic kind of um, path that's been set. So we're taking these ideas from electro hip hop and we're superimposing them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, because electro hip hop would be the place to start. Anyway, I mean, all hip hop at that point is being done with drum machines and turntables anyway. So you don't have a wide palette to work from. Right. You know, and for a lot of, people in the academic world, hip hop was so cool because they see, you know, like white people want to kind of claim it as something that relates to them because there's turntables and that relates to music concrete, you know? So it's kind of like a form of electronic music, which it really is. I actually saw a hip hop producer like a few years back. I did an interview with him and another producer 
and we were talking about that he kept referring to what he did as electronic music and i was like this is brilliant i mean it actually takes it so far outside of the specific genre that he's in and, right. and creates it in a much larger perspective and he's right it is electronic music yeah, absolutely totally. yes you know so we're using these electronic instruments now to create something that's from more of an underground culture. The foundation is from more of an underground culture, but we're trying to bring it together with this, with this jet, with this, you know, for this great jazz fusion performer, this great musician and his vibe and his lineage of music. Right. You know, cause when you think of Herbie, obviously you're not just thinking of his solo career. You're yeah. also thinking of Miles Davis. Miles, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, so there's all this, there's, there's all this like cross-referencing going on in your mind, <laughs> Yeah. you know? So we had so many different reference points to pick from, um, but it really boiled down to a handful and we incorporated them. And it was really kind of how we did it, excuse me. And that's pretty much how Rocket came to be. I mean, we created the track uh, partly in our studio in Brooklyn and partly at a studio called RPM on West 12th Street, which no longer exists. And then we took the track out to California to play to Herbie, who was completely confused. He had no idea what he was listening to at all, you know. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, but we, you know, he, he basically got into the spirit of it and you know, we created, we all three of us kind of stood around, hummed the top line melody for about 15 minutes. You know, he, he, he recorded that. Um, and it came together pretty, pretty quickly. Wow. So, you know, kudos to him for being open-minded enough to receive that actually. Yeah. No, I know it was yeah. like, Hey, I'm waving the flag and just bring me a bottle of water. I don't really care what it is, but he's got to receive it and to, to contribute and create. Yeah, you're absolutely right yeah. about that. And he, yeah. and he did, you know, I, I think he, I, he, he definitely, uh, he, he, he pulled his weight. <laughs> Are you, uh, have you ever discussed this with him years later about the whole, the genesis of it or just like, no, nope. look, no, really? No. I wonder if that's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's a conversation that would be interesting to have. Yeah, well, um, I, I'm I'm sure at some point we'll get around to it. I haven't spoken wow. to him for a long time. Okay, that's awesome, man. And and when it blew up, were you guys surprised, or were you like, you know, I mean, I I could, you know, what was your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, on the one hand, I was, you know, when it was happening, I was kind of like, now nah, I was completely blown away. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sit with whether I kind of, I was able to normalize it. And I really couldn't, like, I just was, it was an experience that was unlike anything I'd ever had. Like it, so it was totally unexpected, you know, but the thing was when we were done with it, we would listen to it and go, Oh no, man, there's something about this. There's something about this. I can't put my finger on it. Um, and we play it for people and they just be like, Oh, like, <laughs> Laswell and I had to deal as material with Electra Records. And the day that the day before we went back to New York, we went to visit Electra and we went, we met with this guy, Tom Zutat, who wound up signing like Guns N' Roses and Metallica, you know, and we played Zutat Rocket. And he was like, he turned all red. He's like, what is this? I have to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, I'm afraid it's spoken for already. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. That had to be pretty cool. I mean, here you are slugging away in like sweaty man caves in the East Village, you know, playing your stuff. And all yep. of a sudden it's like you're everywhere. It had to be like it was that was probably a very quick transition how fast that blew up, too. It was a quick transition. Yeah. yeah. It was like a couple of weeks, basically. Like <laughs> the song came out. All of a sudden it's everywhere. I mean, obviously, like the end, what the, the video is really kind of what spearheaded the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I can't take any credit for that. In fact, I was furious when I first saw it. Why? <laughs> um, I felt that it just, I, I didn't understand the concept of videos. I mean, I was a kid still, I was like 23, you know? So to me, like, I, I felt like they had to 
they had to have a deeper understanding what the song kind of meant. But the thing is, is that I had my own interpretation of it. Okay. You know, I, so no one else would have seen it the way I saw it. And I felt like someone had shot on my kind of like oh. impression of what the song was. What was your impression? <laughs> like how, what was your impression of it? Well, I saw it based on, I think what our initial I guess, conception of the song was that it was something that pertained directly to Herbie's roots, to black music, to hip hop, you know, to a whole bunch of different stuff. So you and, saw this more humanely as opposed to complete robots. No, nah, well, I guess in a way, yeah, it wasn't like the robots to me was more, um, it was, it was kind of like a, you know, quirky white English type sensibility. And I was kind of like, <laughs> It's got nothing to do with this song at all. I'll never watch that again. And of course, all of a sudden, the song goes into heavy rotation <laughs> within a week or something. Like that and I'm kind of like, well, I, I guess it's not that bad after all, is it? <laughs> so to have that kind of success at 23, I'm sure it was a blessing and a curse. What was the what? what and you don't have to go into the blessing, and the curse, but what either at that time or as a result of that, what was the takeaway for you? Um, the takeaway was don't ever sign your publishing uh, right oh. um, over to someone else or your or your writing rights, especially oh. if they're a known criminal who's wanted in several countries uh, and has a, has Interpol warrants out on them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy because like I was really hoping that would not be anything that you'd say. Oh, oh no, I got I got I got definitely got chicken hawked. But um, <laughs> oh, my and, God, uh, I'm so sorry. On look, man, it's part of it's part of the it's part of the experience, you know. I got to tell you, like, it. Yep, you take your <laughs> you pays your money, you takes your turn. Yeah. Um, if I if I'd gotten that money, there's no telling the kind of shit I would have gotten into. Yeah. Like, because I was, I I was basically feral, you know. <laughs> like, I had I've no never... idea what to. <laughs> <laughs> never heard someone describe themselves as feral <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> oh my god you grew up in new york i mean i don't i i'm surprised frankly but here here we are <laughs> i had dude i i i could barely cook myself food you know i didn't know how to take care of money if someone if i'd started seeing checks for like you know a couple hundred grand i would have gone crazy as as was the first bmi check i ever saw was 80 grand Right. I'm 23 years old, getting an eighty thousand dollar check in 1984. Oh my God! What do you do with eighty thousand bucks when you're tw when you're 23 years old and you don't know what you don't even understand what money is except like I gotta I gotta eat. What did you do? Expensive car. I it 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 was gone. I gone, I mean yeah. I don't even remember like just yeah. all kinds of like useless, you know whatever. Let me and, invite a bunch of girls over to get high with me kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. I, I, That's I what you do when you're 23. Time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and it was just, you know, it, I wasn't the person to get the money anyway, yeah. you know? So it's like, it, it's, it's fine that it, it's fine that it went, you I know? You. I mean, it, it isn't fine. It is what it is. Right. But I get you know, what you're and, saying. It, it, it yeah. might have been a blessing in disguise is what you're saying. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. And it was, again, it was part of the, it was part of the learning. The best thing about it though, is that it makes a really good story. <laughs> yeah. But it's so <laughs> it makes sad a really to hear good this story. You know, you know what it's, it, it was devastating when I was younger. Yeah. It's not devastating now. It's again, it's, I, I hope that it can be a cautionary tale for other people. Sure. As much as, as much as anything. But it's an amazing story, and it kind of like creates an interesting backdrop to what was going on at that point in time. Yeah. But yeah, you know, like that that happened, and you know, I mean, after after that, it got really squirrely being in material, you know. So that was a whole other thing. Um, it was a very interesting time. So I gained a lot and I lost a lot, you know. Um, but what I did gain in terms of experience helped push me on to the next place. You know, if all this stuff hadn't happened, I would never, ever have gone on to do the rest of the work that I did. Just wouldn't have happened. What What made you move to L.A.? Um, initially, because I, I lived there twice. Uh, 
I moved there the first time because I was working with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And, uh, you know, I'd been there for like months at that point. And I was like, ah, I'm just going to move out of here. You know, New York didn't really have anything for me at that point. It just wasn't a good place for a person in my position to be, I felt. So mm -hmm. I left. And, and then I came back. And the second, what made you come back? Um, wait. Oh, yeah. What made me come back? Um, <laughs> I lost my timeline for a second there. No, what made right. me come back? What made me come back is a simple thing that's that's threaded through my life, and that's a, a, an extreme dislike for LA. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you because culturally, I mean. It's a, just the West Coast and East Coast. It's just a different different vibe. I mean, completely. I mean, I've met so many nice people out in L.A., but, like, they're not East Coast people. It's really different. And I'm not saying we're better than them, or, but it's just, you know, if you were born and bred in New York City. Oh, you can say it. You can say it. <laughs> no, but if you're born and bred in New York City, <laughs> like, for me, I always, like, find when I'm talking to other guys like that, there's just an already established... Yeah, it's a kinship. Uh, yeah, a kinship, especially like around the same age. Like you just said, fucking New York in the 70s, man. If you got home at night, you won, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, th that's plain and simple, you know, between the guys <laughs> playing three card Monty and and cocaine and crack and not crack. It was later. But, you know, it was a fucking dangerous place. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> sorry, man. I didn't want to go off on a New York. Uh, no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. And you're you 100 percent. We we. We both lived it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, but no, I, I Los Angeles is, I'm, I don't know why I'm holding back here. Los Angeles sucks. It's a terrible place. <laughs> I don't like it. You know, I've never liked it. I never will like it. Like, I'm so happy not to be there. I would do, I would, I think Los Angeles is one of the, if you're in music and recording, at least in my experience, it's one of the best places in the world to be. Yes. If you're living there, it's one of the worst places in the world to be. Yeah. I, I, you, I, I think only the promise of ridiculous amounts of money would get me to move back there. Yeah. Actually, not even then, because the air quality is so bad that I know I'd be poisoning myself and my family. Yeah. So, nah, nah, can't do it. And the second time you moved out there was, I'm assuming, for to work again because you had so much opportunity going on. It was a combination of that, and uh, my ex-wife at the time was moving there with um, with my kid. So yeah, I you know I was just like, well, I have to be near her. So All right. meeting my kid. So yeah, of course, you know, I, yeah. I went I went back to Los Angeles and kind of braved it for many <laughs> many years, and you know, just I think the the end of 2019 there was something about it where i was just i, I was just like you got to get out of here something something feels not right and something bad's going to happen and you were uh, right <laughs> it's good good timing very good timing, timing. is good <laughs> yep holy yeah. smokes um, that's right yeah okay and i i i've been divorced too so i know that i know that's not that's a, just a whole other hassle um, oh, it's no fun. No, there's nothing good about that, man. Yeah. Uh, okay. When I want to go. Okay. Since some of the projects I want to cover with you are related to this, let's get this out of the way and address it first. We, I kidded you about it before the, uh, before we started, you are known for firing drummers so much so that you have not one, but two blog posts that you wrote on your website that, that are assuming tongue in cheek called Michael Beinhorn fires drummers part one and part two. <laughs> and, uh, and you candidly state I've fired drummers on roughly 20 to 40% of the recordings I've produced. And you also candidly state one of the responsibilities a record producer has is to fire people at any level when they're not performing well enough because in an, in an ensemble of players the drummer is the first musician to be recorded and is therefore ultimately responsible for the foundation on which the record is built now it was interesting some of the comments that people responded with there uh were pretty inane um and, and i i always 
it, responses to comments to th to somebody else's thoughts in general always makes me curious. Like, I don't understand why you feel why not why people feel the need to do that in the first place. Like, whether you agree or disagree, you know what I mean. Like, I don't like or have the time to do it. Quite frankly, but um, mm -hmm. if if you could address this thing with drummers, it'd be good because to to me it seems like to some extent, like a mountain's been made out of a molehill because you're probably like good producers would are probably doing shit like this all day long. Like, you know, get rid of your drummer or, you know, get, you know, your keyboard player is not right for this part or this track. Or, I mean, that's, that is your responsibility. Yeah. Well, this, this whole thing came about because one of the drummers on one of the records I did, who I did fire, Actually, I didn't fire her. I recommended that she be fired to right. the band. So they're ultimately the ones I didn't have. They told me when we started the project, I didn't have the mandate to fire her. Like they were very clear about this. Yeah. So you can imagine they must have had a pretty good reason to change their minds and do, do a one, 180. Yeah. Um, so the drummer, Patty Schemmel, she had a movie made about her called Hit So Hard. And at one point in the movie, she went into very, very great lengths. The pe actually, the people who made the movie went into very great lengths about me specifically and how I fired her off the record, um, how I had it in for her the, the entire time that the record was being made pre right. prior, to, prior to recording. And um, they, they, so they kind of like made, they almost made her sort of downfall post that record about me that I kind of triggered you know, the events leading up to her getting back into shooting smack and stuff like that, or however she was taking it. And I, I started to receive a lot of very angry emails from people who somehow managed to find me, um, which, you know, I, I guess I, I wasn't surprised about the amount of vitriol involved, but I was kind of, at a certain point, I was kind of like, um, I'm not going to just sit here and, and take this. Like that's, it's not really in my nature to do that. So I, I, I kind of, I felt that I had to respond to it. Yeah. And as far as what you're saying, like there's a certain point in time where like many producers would fire drummers. In fact, I knew producers who would basically just say, who's your, you know, the band would come and who's your drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy would raise his hand. He's like, get out. <laughs> You know what? As a, if you're a consultant with a Fortune 500 company and you come in there, oftentimes the recommendation is you need to get rid of your CFO, you need to get rid of your controller, you need to get rid of your head of audit, internal audit. It's yeah. kind of like I don't. I mean, it seems kind of like the same thing. Well, in many respects, it is, especially if that CFO isn't doing their job to the you know to the best. But in some cases, some producers just like using their own guy. Like I right. got my drummer, I work with him. He's going to be playing drums on this record. If you don't like that, you can get someone else to produce your record. Right. You know, um, my attitude was more like, let's see what the drummer can do. You know, if the drummer is capable, like I don't want to break up someone's band. So if the drummer can play on their record, they should be playing on their record. Right. But if they can't lay down the groove, if they can't play properly, or if they're going to forget parts when they're in the middle of a take, we may have a problem, yeah. you know, which is what happened on that particular recording. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I've worked with some drummers who are exceptional. Um, it's funny because this one drummer I worked with, Dean Castronova, who actually wound up playing on the whole record the first time we worked together, he just, he wasn't in the right headspace. And we had to work together to figure out like what was gonna get him to where he needed to be. And, you know, we just, I just gradually started eliminating people from the room. Like, you know, people in, in it, it was an Ozzy Osbourne record. Yeah. And I think actually it started with Ozzy. I just said, Ozzy, I think you have to go home because Dean can't play with, with you around. And he was more than happy to go. You know, and it was just kind of getting into an atmosphere where the drummer could actually do his best work. And once right. that, once the field was clear for him, he just threw it down and everyone was like, oh my God, those are the best drum tracks I've ever heard. Uh, you know, but that's what you want. If I'm yes. going to listen to it, 
if I'm going to listen to only a drummer playing, even though he's laying down a foundation for a song, no one's going to really be paying attention to this. I'd like it to be something where I can actually sit and listen to the drum track on its own and be like, oh, shit, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, just someone laying a groove down. Um, with band dynamics, you don't necessarily always have that. Right. Sometimes you have to work with, you know, what, you know, you have to get, make the best out of what you've been given your lot, so to speak. Right. So, and, you know, as a producer, my feeling is I have to accept that, but there's just also a certain, there, there's gotta be kind of like a boundary that, that, that you don't want to cross. Once the boundary has been breached, you kind of have to look at the drummer and go like, am I keeping you here because you serve a valuable function because you're, because you're serving this project? And you're serving your bandmates in the songs, or I'm keeping you here to spare your feeling, you know, and right. keep you from getting upset. Because I have to tell you that anyone who hears this record isn't going to give a solitary fuck about your feelings no. or about the fact that I tried to keep you from being upset and make you feel better. They're going to want to hear like a good song, and they want to get, they're going to want to hear someone who's able to lay the foundation down. And if you can't do that, I think it's time that you pack your bags and go. Right. And I'm assuming you gave uh, you, you you spent a lot of time working with Dean on the Ozzy record to figure out how you could optimize what he had to bring. I'm assuming that's what you do. I'm assuming that's your M.O. You don't just go in right away and say, hey, you're done. Get the fuck out. I'm sure you have a conversation. <laughs> like, what, what's going, yeah, I mean, like that's, you know, people how you do one thing is like how you do everything for the most part. Yeah. You know, so, well, I'm, you know. On the whole, the whole record was different because that was the first time someone actually leveled me, leveled a mandate at me, like, you can't fire her, you know? And I was like, okay, well, if I'm not, if I'm not able to fire her, which wasn't my, you know, first of all, it wasn't even my plan going in. It's like, uh, I hadn't really thought about that, but thank you for telling me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's an odd request know, so, to so make before like, you start a record. It's an, yeah. It's kind of like, do you know something I don't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what happened was it's like, I was like, look, if this is how it's going to be, then I'm going to take every precaution to ensure that we get the best drum tracks possible. What's that precaution? You rehearse the shit out of the songs. You right. know, you make sure that the drummer is in fighting form and ready to ready to throw down and do what and you know do what they have to do. I'm pre you know presuming, of course, that the drummer is someone who is capable of doing this and who wants to. Once they get in the room everything gets shut out, no distractions. They just boom, 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 get it done. Even if they're not, even if technically they're not that good, they put the right amount of like emotion into it. And you can feel it. You can feel those things when you listen back to a track. Sure. Yeah. Those are things that I listen to. If I start, if I listen back to anyone's performance and I start to nod out, then I know something's <laughs> That's wrong. That's not a good sign. No, this yeah. is the thing actually. No, it's true because I find, because this job requires so much concentration. Yeah. You know, I find that, if I'm locked into something, like it's very, if something distracts me, I start to get drowsy. This is just something I know about myself. Right. So when I'm listening to drum tracks, which on their own are, are pretty boring, unless like the drummer has actually done a great job, I start to nod out. And if I'm nodding out, something's wrong. Okay. Yeah. yeah you know, sure. and, and you, so, you know, I've heard interviews with guys like Jeff Beck and Warren Haynes uh, that I could think of two of course excellent musicians and the first thing they'll say is you gotta have a drummer that's if we if our drummer isn't good we're fucked in in any band so i mean well yeah i mean you gotta know where the one is and you gotta know where the backbeat is <laughs> that's basically it. that's it if you know where the one and the backbeat are you're fine you know if you know where that you know the drummer well enough to know where that backbeat's coming down you can do whatever the fuck you want yeah you know but you have to have a drummer that you can rely on. If the drummer is like someplace else or if they're not focused, then it's like, hey, you just destroyed our song. Get the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you for addressing that. I just wanted to like clear that out of the way because it was really funny when I read your uh, Michael Beinhorn <laughs> Fires drummers part one and part two. <laughs> on your... Well, I mean, it's a, that was also in response to, some, to some, an online post. And yeah, I think yeah, I, that's yeah. really what triggered it. Someone actually wrote Michael Beinhorn fires drummers. It was kind of like an outing me publicly online type thing. And I was kind of right. like, all right, if you're going to out me online like that, I'm going to out myself. Yeah. Let me go with it. <laughs> no, I listen, yeah. man, everybody, when you are in charge of something, 
it's not an easy job and you got to make hard decisions and that's just it. And if someone's hiring you for something, I mean, and, and you're putting a hundred percent of yourself into it. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? You have to be, well, honest. this is the, this is the mistake that people make. People think for some reason that when they're hiring a producer, they're hiring a new friend or something like that. Someone to commiserate with. Like when I work with the chili peppers, I saw a pattern with what they did. They were hiring their idols to produce their records. Like Andy Gill from Gang of Four produced the first one. Okay. George Clinton produced the second one. These are guys they like adore, that they yeah. worship. You know, and for the third record, which I wound up doing, they were looking at Mick Jones from The Clash. You know, I mean, these are all like luminaries of that period in time. Yeah. But these are all guys that are not record producers. They're guys you could hang out with and, and like at, have a great time like listening to their stories but like yeah. as far as getting getting something great from that relationship it's not really going to happen in the way that you need it you as a producer you need to have someone who's going to come in and be honest and tell you the facts from their perspective they may not even jive with your perception of what the facts are but at least you have another perspective now to look at what you're doing you know, that you're not stuck in the myopia of your own, your own kind of your own impression of what it is that you're doing. Having an extra perspective is invaluable, especially when it's someone that you can trust. Well, man, you know, if anything, hats off to you, because it's real easy when you get a gig. You go in there and think, well, these guys are paying me. I don't want to I don't want to ruffle their feathers. And yes. You know what I mean? So it's the easiest it, thing in the world. Yeah. In any capacity, you know, when you're in the service business as a consultant, right. That's, you know, yeah. And, but that's not your job. When I mean, no, when it, comes it down isn't. To it, yeah. it isn't. I mean, I've heard a lot of producers say, well, I'm really more of a cheerleader. And it's like, I'm not. <laughs> sorry, I'm man. not a cheerleader. <laughs> you know, like, the, th the thing is, is that if I hear something that I love, I can't stop talking about it. I won't be able to control how I feel about mm. it. You know, if I hear something that's not, that's amazing, I'll just tell everyone about it until they say, would you please stop? Right. You know, I'm tired of hearing you talk about this, you know, but the enthusiasm has to be real. If you blow smoke up people's asses all day long, and some people are very good at this, uh, you know, you can convince them that what they're doing is great. But the real acid test comes after the record's done and people and listen to what they're doing and they're kind of like, I'm, I don't care about this. You know, then it's like, what did all that, you know, happy talk, where, where did that get you? You yeah. spent a whole bunch of money on some guy who basically lied to you because it's a lot easier to tell, to tell you how great you are and you yeah. bought it. Yeah. You know, to me, that's unethical. I it is unethical, 100%. Yeah. You're a cheerleader in the, of their success. But that's mutually exclusive from you got to do your job and get them. There. Yes. Yeah, yes. totally, man. You, you know, I mean, my feeling is you have to prove yourself by getting into the trenches with an artist and right. saying, I will back you every step of the way. That's a lot different, but it's also a lot more valuable to an artist than saying, you're great. You're great. Yeah. Everything yeah. you do is wonderful. You know, I just love this. I love that. It's like, I don't love this. I don't love that. But I'm going to work with you to, to get it to a point where we both say, I love this. Yeah, man, it's like parenting. You, you see parents that are like, oh, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. And the kid's not wonderful, man. And is a fuck up and you need to tell them and do something and put some consequences in place. I mean, you yeah. see that all day long, it's, you know, especially when you're a young parent, you see and you're, you know, you're with other parents and other kids. Yeah. Uh, all right. For, I'm going to for each of these artists that I'm going to these projects <clears> you worked <throat> on, if you could tell me how you wound up connecting with them. Um, and since I know you need to be attracted to an artist on a visceral level, what was the compelling uh, vibe that or song that attracted you to them? Uh, and I'll go over these for each of them, a cool or interesting story. And then uh, the biggest challenge that particular project presented for you. So let's start with uh, the Chili Peppers, Mother's Milk. How'd you wind up connecting with them for this project? Well, I'd already done a record with them by that point. So my working with them on Mother's Milk was kind of a foregone conclusion. Like they didn't, they weren't even thinking about anyone else at that point, which was nice because, you know, we were all kind of part of the family. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, so like we had a couple of false starts on that record because of the original guitarist, Odeed, 
Yeah. Uh, which was really, really awful. Um, but, you know, we started, they, they started working on music in, uh, in the rehearsal studio. And I was really heartened because John Frashanti, who, you know, at that point was 17 years old and had just been in the band for a very short time. He was that young. I didn't know that. Wow. Oh, yeah. He was a baby. Yeah. Everyone wow. else used to call him Greeny. <laughs> wow. Um, he, he presented us with this song called Knock Me Down, which wound up being the first single off that record. Uh -huh. And I was kind of stunned. I was like, wait a sec, this is a kid is 17 years old and he wrote this piece of music. Like, who does this? Like, this is really good, <laughs> you know? Like, who had, having those kind of compositional skills and, you know, and understanding arrangement to the extent that he did. Um, it just blew me away. And then, you know, we, you know, we were trying, we were kind of trying to narrow down a, um, a cover song for the record. Um, because we felt that, that we needed, we needed something. And, um, one was obviously higher ground. I think the other one was, if you want me to, st I think it, we did it. We worked on an upper version of the higher, the harder they come by Jimmy Cliff. Jimmy and Cliff. also, um, if you want me to stay by slice Stone, but I was kind of like, no, nah, it's gotta be higher ground. I mean, yes. if you want me to stay is a great song, but it's a great song by virtue of the vocal performance. If you have been, I mean, totally. they, already, they also did a, well, they did, they did a version of, if you want me to stay after the fact. And it was like, come on. I mean, it's, you know, you can't touch Sly's version of this song. You just, right. it's just one of those things that you don't want to get near. Yeah. It's not about the song, you know? No, it's the whole, it, you're right. That song is, there are songs like that. There are a lot of songs like that where it's that artist owns it period. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Sly, Sly managed to own everything he ever wrote. So <laughs> he did, you know, it, it's just, he, he was just so amazing. Yeah. Oh. A lot of those funk um, bands in the seventies were like that, man. They were just like, you know, um, magic. Yeah. Without, without a doubt. Uh, so when we had those two things, it was, it was pretty clear that we were going to be able to do something halfway decent. Although I don't think any of us, again, were really prepared for the um, level of success that the record had. That's so cool, man. And initially what was the, the vibe that attracted you to the, the peppers? Um, it's funny because when I first got a demo, um, excuse me. And this is really funny. This is also funny because, excuse me, I was like really down on my luck at that point, knocking oh. on people's doors going like, help, please. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no one wanted to touch this band. Like absolutely no one wanted to work with them at all. You know, I, except for Mick Jones, maybe um why so well a couple of reasons you know this is like the hair metal era and you had bands that were the, the music industry by that time had kind of like had really sort of tightened the lanes on people um musically so if you were if you play, worked in a specific genre you were pretty locked into that genre like people oh, okay. weren't really you know, bands that did what the Chili Peppers did where you kind of like crossed different okay. types of, of genres together. It was really underground type stuff. The okay. fact that they'd been signed to a major label was, was confusing to a lot of people. So no one, consequently, no one really knew, knew what to do with them, which is why they were allowed to work with guys like Clinton and Andy Gill. Okay. You know, it was kind of like a, well, what do we do with them type thing? On top of that, the EMI couldn't stand them. Like they, they hated the band um, for a variety of reasons. They just, they just didn't typify anything that people knew or understood. It was, some, it was a completely different sensibility. The music that I heard on the, origin, on the initial demo that I got was, I mean, it wasn't that great. Like the performing, the playing was really good. But the music itself wasn't that great. But what got to me after listening to it for 
you know, a time or two was there was something underneath. There was something that was lying below the surface. And I couldn't put my finger on what it was until I heard it a few more times and I realized it was their personality. Like it was this combination of these guys together. And ultimately what they needed was the right framework to really magnify that. Like that's all their song, their music really is. It's kind of a framework to magnify who they are as people. As much as or more so, I think, than any artist I've worked with. Um, they just, there's something about like the, the aggregate of them together. They're hungry, man. They've always come across as super hungry guys. You know, like, they, yeah, like, yeah, you, you need someone to, you know, go out and dig a trench 30 yards. Those are, the, you know, those are the guys you want doing it. You know, you want those are the guys you want to be in the foxhole with sort of. Yeah. But there's also like a very special, like emotional bond between Flea and Anthony. And if the music, if the, if the, the right songs are there to kind of like to, to bring that across, you know, it just you just get hit with this. You know, with that sensibility. And that's what was there from the very beginning. But the music that they'd done and the way that, that it was presented really didn't bring that across as well as it could have, you know? And I was like, oh God, I mean, this is something that I can really sink my teeth into, you know, to really help get these guys to a place where their vision is a little bit more brought into focus and a little right. bit more clear. And in, in the record speaks for itself on that, man. It was a great album. And talk about think higher ground. I mean, and, and knock me down. There's great songs on there, man. Yeah. Uh, biggest challenge about that project? Um, well, there were a bunch, actually. You know, um, Flea and Anthony were, were kind of, I guess they were sort of on the outs at that point. So they weren't really coming down and listening to anything that we were doing. You know, so it was down to me to kind of get the guitar tones for the record. Like, I didn't have a whole lot of input from anybody. And I think John was more kind of like, uh, do what you want. Right. Uh, so when they came in and heard it, they're kind of like, they looked at me and they're like, hey, this sounds more like a metal record. <laughs> and I was like, you weren't here. What was I supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they weren't really, they didn't really seem fond of it um, and how it came out. Uh, so that was kind of, that was a little rough. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah. How do you, how do you, uh, that's just part of the job when, when you, when they don't, something that your client doesn't agree with you on. And it's, I guess that's, yeah. It's like, well, at that, you know, at the 11th yeah. hour, it's like, ah, you should have been here. Right. Like, right. Yeah. I'm sorry, but like, this is, this is the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Hindsight 2020 that afterwards, did they come back and Hey man, it all worked. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not and 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 i don't I, I don't i neither expect nor do i nor do i want anything like that i mean the success of the records in, in in every case to me the success of the record speaks for itself as you right. said right and that's what matters the most my opinion the band's opinion i mean obviously if they're happy i'm it makes me happy too sure but if the people who the record were, was made for, if they love it, then I've done my job. Yeah. End the conversation. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you said Flea and Anthony not getting along and then the guitar tones. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Soul Asylum as another drummer casualty. Um, the band was dropped from A&M because the two albums before, before Grave Dancers Union, what you worked on, sold really poorly. You come in, produce the record, uh, replace their original drummer with Sterling Campbell, who was on here. Lovely, lovely guy. Yes, he uh, is. He winds up becoming a full band member and then quits later on. <laughs> but, uh, and the record goes triple platinum. Um, I'm trying to see which one I want to, what did you, what do you think you brought to the table there that was different that allowed this record to become so successful after, you know, they were totally down in the dumps for two records. Um, to be honest with you, I think it was, I think that they needed encouragement 
and I think that they also needed a little more toughness to their sound, like a little bit more edge to what they did because the records that they'd done previously, I mean, I, I won't take anything away from the guys who produced their records. I think Ed Stasium, I think who did the first record they did for a and He's a fantastic producer. I'm sure. pretty sure that was his record. Um, and, you know, I mean, Steve Jordan is great as well, but sonically, tonally, I didn't think that, that those records had the kind of impact that they needed to, but, you know, in fairness, Grave Dancers Unit had something that neither of those records had, and that was really, really amazing song. Yeah. Like, the other two records did have good songs, but they had nothing in terms of songwriting that could touch what Dave wrote on Grave Dancers Union. It's just, I mean, he had so many songs on that record that were good, three of which obviously are classics. One, well, one of which is like I virtually, I guess you could say iconic. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so. It, it was, and it, it was one of those projects too, where when I got, when I came upon it, I found out that there were about like five or six other guys that were in the running for it. And I just was scratching my head going, you know, why isn't every record producer in creation scrambling over themselves to get to this? Because these songs are so good. They were amazing. You know, the, I, I still have that demo tape. Actually, the first song on there was Runaway Train, you know, which was I mean, it's such a great yeah. song. It's more of an acoustic version, you know, but it was it's easy to spruce something like that up. Like yeah. you can orchestrate a song like that very easily. You know, so I'm sitting there listening to it like, how come no one can hear this song? Like, mm. this is a great song. This is one of the best songs I've heard in a long time. And people aren't like killing themselves to get to this. Like, sure, I'll take the job. Right. I love this. <laughs> yeah. How did you how did they uh, connect with you? Like, how did you get the call for that? Uh, my manager at the time, a guy named John Warner, um, was friendly with people at Sony and he heard about the project. He was a fan of the band and uh, he was friendly with a, with a good friend of Dave's mm. who insinuated me in there. And, uh, you know, I managed, I went out to Minneapolis to meet with them and uh, we hit it off. That's cool. How did you know Sterling? I didn't. Um, I was, uh, he was recommended to me by the guy who was the, uh, head of A&R at Sony at that time, David Kahn. Wow. He's that's also interesting. very, a great record producer. Yeah. He, he, he turned me on to Sterling and I was kind of like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this guy will work. Yeah. You know, so he came in and, and Sterling was, he, he was just so sure of himself. Like, it was, a, it was a drag to watch Grant, who was the band's drummer, kind of run out of steam, which is pretty much what happened. Like he, he actually was doing, he was doing okay. Like we got four or five tracks out of him and they sound, I mean, they, they sound good. You know, I think he played on Black Gold, if I'm not mistaken, which was the second single. Mm. Uh, so he was, he was doing okay. And then we get to song number five and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a sec, what's going on here? Like he doesn't sound like he's there anymore. You know, he just started to fade. Yeah. You know, and I think the combination of him either being fatigued, running out of gas, I'm really not sure. I think it, it, he, it started to wear on him and he started, he knew what was happening. Right. And it just completely deflated his, his self-confidence. So we, after a while, it was like, Grant, you know, I don't know what to say. You know, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but we really don't have a choice here. Right. Right. And, um, Okay, cool. The great record, Social Distortion. White Light, uh -huh. White Heat, White Trash, another drummer casualty. Uh, uh, <laughs> how did you wind up? Two, that record had three drummers. <laughs> <laughs> is, that your, is that your record? <laughs> is that your personal record? For <laughs> it is. It is, yeah. Uh, how did you connect with those guys? Um. I was at that point a staff producer um, for Epic Records. Okay. So I was working with their artists and Richard Griffiths, who was the company president, introduced me to them. And 
you know, it was just, it was one of those things. I, I like the band. I love Mike. Yeah. You know, he's fantastic. So I was like, okay, absolutely. I'm in. Very cool. How did you like being, uh, if you're comfortable talking about it, if you're not, that's cool. Uh, being in a, 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 for an employee, for lack of a better word, versus a, a freelancer. Um, it had its perks, mm. you know, um, it was, yeah, it was salaried, you yeah. know, so it's not bad having like a, yeah, having yeah. a regular paycheck. <laughs> you know what they're coming in on the first of the month. I feel you, man. Yeah. yeah. Right. I hear you. But I also got paid per project as well. So that was also nice, you mm. know, so it's, it's good. And, you know, it, it's good in both ways. Yeah. Um, you know, it was nice. It, I, I kind of felt insulated from the outside at the same time. There were things going on in the outside where I was kind of like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, I liked Epic very much. I mean, I think, I still think Richard is one of the greatest record company presidents ever. So, you that's know, cool. I enjoy, and that's, it's not easy to say things about that, like that about people who are executives in a record company, because yeah. I find by and large, they really aren't, that great <laughs> yeah i'm sure i'm sure you know some of, but with that said some of the a lot of the ones i've dealt with actually have been pretty pretty smashing you know and he was definitely one of them that's cool uh yeah i've been pretty fortunate in that regard uh cool or interesting story about working with uh the social distortion guys um well there were actually quite a few but i think we actually spent months trying to get vocals on that record. Wow. I don't, yeah, I mean, Mike, he's one of those people, you get him in a recording studio, he doesn't have the same connection with his songs as he does when he performs it live. Oh, you know? Interesting. And, you know, some people are like that, it's fine. Sure. But I kept pushing him and, you know, saying we got to do it again. And he would get so frustrated. He'd be like, Mike, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> and, you know, I'd be like, look, we're not, you know, you, you're just not getting it. And, you know, I wasn't really able to articulate it as well, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, I tried playing records for him and stuff like that. But it's kind of like an internal thing. Like the, the mechanism has to get tripped inside of yourself. And all of a sudden you just have that kind of, oh, that." Oh, why didn't you just say so? Uh, so one okay. day, one day he's in the studio and he nails it. And I'm kind of like, that's it. That's it. And he's like, what I do? I play it back. And he's like, oh, that? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, that's what you wanted for months? You've been trying to get me to do that? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, it worked. After that, it worked. Yeah. yeah. He just nailed it after that. It was great. He's a, a great entertainer, man. He is definitely a consummate entertainer. Yeah, yeah. He's a, what a character that guy is. Uh, one of my all-time favorite records, man, Super Unknown, Soundgarden. Uh, album debuted at number four, sold over nine million copies, opened at number, number one, one, pal. Right, opened at number <laughs> one. All right, sorry about that. I have it here. You know why. It says number four and it says number one. Open at number one on Billboard, yeah. two Grammys. You talk about good songs holy mother of god how did you wind up connecting with those guys for that project well i had the same manager as i did for the soul song record and he was okay. like have you heard of this band and i was like yeah i kind of know him uh and he was like well they're going to make a new record and i was like oh okay cool and he was like i think that they've got a producer already and i was like well, then why are we talking about yeah. it? He's like, because it's not engraved in stone yet and all's fair in love and war. Right. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm game. You know, I was like, I'll try anything once. <laughs> so they flew me up to Seattle to meet with these guys. And we just, we kind of clicked, you know, uh, and they decided that they would like to do the record with me. So we actually went to do two songs pri prior to tracking Super Unknown, two songs that one of which wound up on the final version of the record and the other of which just got, um, got tossed. Um, so that was, my, that was my breaking in period with them. 
and from there we went on to make the record it's one of the best records ever made i mean it's just it's like every song on there is just you, you can't imp you cannot improve it i mean it's just perfect the way it is thank you uh give me tell me a cool or uh interesting story about working with them um yeah i mean i, I don't really know where to start that you could that, uh, that you could talk about it without throwing anybody under the bus um yeah no I, it's it's all you know it's, it's all out there anyway uh excuse me um i guess one of one of my favorites which i, I think i've pardon me told a lot is uh about how black hole sun came to be um uh, because chris had been he'd been sending me demos for music and the demos were kind of they're getting kind of iffy you know they weren't that great he sent me a, song, a demo at one point that had like 13 songs on it 11 to 13 songs and i i think that nowadays if you'd heard songs like this you'd be like wow it's pretty good but they weren't really up to par for a sound garden record or at least the one that we were going to make and i was like all right i have to talk to chris now so i got him on the phone and i was like you know i kind of want to get in get into his head a little bit and i was like you know the, these songs are kind of you know they're, they're not they're, they're not quite as strong as they need to be what's motivating me to write them and eventually he was able to identify that he was basically writing these songs for you know for his fans that he was trying to make or he, he was trying to make stuff that he felt would appeal to Soundgarden fans and I was like why would you do that I mean I, I that's I guess it's sort of a rhetorical question because it's easy to answer why you want people to buy your record but the real thing is like the the point that I was trying to make to him was don't you think that people love you because of the songs that you've already written you know, you don't have to try and write songs or rehash an idea that you've already, a point that you've already made, like it's time to move on. You know, what's the sensibility of Soundgarden right now? Who are you? That's what people want to know. They're not interested in stuff that you've, um, you know, that you've, that, you, that you've already done. So uh, he, we, we got, we made it past that point. And I was like, all right, so what kind of music do you like? You know, what do you, what, what really inspires you and turns you on? He's like the Beatles and cream. And I was like, okay, write a song that sounds like the Beatles and cream, you know? So <laughs> two and a half, three weeks later, I get a tape um, with four songs on it. One of which is fell on black days. The first song on there, the other two, one was a song called anxious which never got used. It was still really good. It was like kind of more of a Hendrixy type bluesy song. And he got Jerry Cantrell to come over and play guitar on it, which is awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. And then he, a song called Tighter and Tighter, which wound up on their next record, which I loved, but I, I love that song. And the last song was Black Hole Sun. And the moment I heard it, I was like, what in the holy hell is this? What is this? Like, I've never heard anything like this before. I mean, he'd just gone beyond at that point. And I played it like 15 times and called him up. And I was like, you're a goddamn genius. We're going to make a record. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, man. My uh, man, goosebumps. That's a really cool story. A couple, it is. A couple of questions. That has got to be a tough thing for an artist where they're at, you know, they've achieved a certain level of success. <laughs> And they want to keep making music they like, but now they have this real or perceived obligatory responsibility to satisfy a population of fans. And it's got to be a tough thing for them to sit and not think about, you know, that oblig that perceived obligatory obligation. It's a mental battle that's um i guess reinforced by people in the music industry who don't actually understand what it takes to be an artist right and that you kind of the, the reality of being an artist and working with artists is, is that you have to accept who they are first and foremost and that means warts and all and if they should change and do something different than what it is that you sign them for you just kind of have to roll with it and be like wow you know okay this is fine like no, 
David Bowie went through so many changes oh, in terms yeah, of, man. you know, in, in terms of how he presented his music. I mean, he was always the same guy, but the presentation changed constantly. Yes. And he lost a lot of fans for it. You know, I mean, he gained new ones, obviously, but people who appreciated him as an artist, though, stuck with him throughout his career because they're right. like, I love David Bowie. I don't care about the genre that he's performing and I love him, the artist. People in record companies don't always understand that. They don't go an artist by his very nature, her very nature. They have to be allowed the space to change and do what it is that they want to do or else I didn't really like them for them. I liked them for what I felt that they were bringing, what I, what I felt that they were doing that was familiar to me, which means I prefer the genre of music that they're in as opposed to the, the, their art, personal artistry. You know, what... There's, I mean, there's, there's multiple levels to being an artist. I mean, one of the problems here is that you're also dealing with people who are highly sensitive. You have to be careful about how you're talking to people, you know? Uh, and a lot of people in the music industry do not understand this, you know? But it, a lot of what informs artistry isn't just the creativity, it's the head fuckery, you know? The fact that you can get yourself into a mindset just because of the stressors that are involved in being creative that cause you to think a certain way, like not feel a certain way, but think a certain way. Right. So your brain gets into a jag of like, I should be doing this instead of I want to do that. I should be doing this as a thought. I want to be doing that is where your heart takes you. Right. You know? So you have two different dynamics that are working against each other diametrically and at that point, like in an artist, you create a lot of chaos and tension. And this will push people over the edge for sure. And also make them produce some of the worst work that they've ever done because they're basically trying to chase the dragon of pleasing somebody else. That's where you have a problem. How did you know, Michael, um, when Chris came to you with these songs, and you went through them. He said, man, what are you doing? How did you know that he wasn't, that he was, tr that he wasn't doing what he wanted to do just by listening to the songs? Well, I mean, this is my job, or it's at okay. least part of my job. Part of my job is to, is to have an innate understanding of that. Okay. You know, to sense it. Okay. That's, you fair. know, to, yeah, to kind of get inside of it. So you, you need an intu a good intuitive sense. Yeah. Which is part of what also, like, which, which is part of what I Im impart to people, you know, in, in training and stuff like that as well. Like from the educational point of view, and it's something that I brought up in my book, to have a somatic awareness of what you're listening to, to, to listen to what your body is telling you. That's where your intuition comes from. That's how people are able to make decisions about something like that, something that someone else made where you weren't directly involved in the creation of it, but you can still get a sense about what it is because it hits something internal in you. You know, it makes you feel a certain way. You know, a feeling isn't just something that you're able to analyze and say, I feel this way. It's actually a physical it's sensation a, yeah. that, that begins totally. in your body. Totally. This is where intuition comes from. This is how you're able to analyze whether you like something or you dislike something. To that extent, how important is it that you get to know your artists before you work with them? Because, you know, uh, you and I are getting intuition about each other. We've been on the phone 90 minutes. Eight mm -hmm. minutes into this call, we didn't have that intuition. So it's developed. Is there like a, a certain amount of time you've got to spend, even if it's a couple of hours, but to get, the, you know, to, to hone into the vibes of who's this person? Um. Look, if, if you're experienced with stuff like this, you can do stuff, you can do something like that in about five minutes. Okay. You know, I mean, if I'm around people enough, I just, or if, or if I'm around enough people enough, I pick up on different vibes. I can read them really fast. Okay. You know, but <clears throat> being able to hone that and turn it into something where, okay, I can get inside you. And by listening to your music, I understand from an emotional standpoint what it is that you're looking for and what it is that you actually need. That's a whole different thing. You know, okay. that takes time. That takes listening to a person's music. You know, 
and also being around them a fair amount, you know, but to kind of get an intuitive sense of who they are, you know, you can pick up on that kind of stuff pretty fast. It's nice to have some of the, um, you know, some, some, some of the, you know, areas in the, in the painting paint, you know, colored in for you right. as you go, right. like, okay, you know, they had a messed up childhood. That's why they're the way they are. Right. Or you know, just, just getting little just, bits of insight yeah. here and there. Right. Um, right. You know, or seeing them react to a, you know, a particular type of situation, like a stressful situation. Yeah. Like how do they, you know, does it, does the person's personality change much when they're in this type of situation? So you're, you con know. you're constantly <laughs> observing. Yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's an investment doing things like this. It's an investment because I want to be able to deliver the best work that I can with an artist, understanding their insecurities, understanding what motivates them, what, what disempowers them. You know, it helps me be able to navigate the situation better and to do the best work I can for them, which in turn makes me feel good. Yeah, because right. I want to know that I'm doing my best work. I'm not in there just to earn a paycheck. Sure, sure. I'm not interested. I mean, I'm frankly, I'm not interested in that. You know, I like making money very, very much. It's wonderful. I got a family. I want to take care of them. Absolutely. I like to eat. Yeah. I like having a roof over my head, you know, right. all those things. But like, there's a certain point if you're involved in art where it's not a job anymore, where it's kind of like a, it's, it's like a calling. It's like something that you, you know, that you're like, all right, I, 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 I was asked to be here basically. Right. You know, like, I would do this me. for free if I, it, but I'm not going to, but it's, I like well, it no. enough that I would. Yeah. I mean, the compensation is also part of the arrangement. Like it's right. got, there has to be something that comes back to you for the work that you do. Absolutely. I agree yeah. with you hundred percent, but it's yeah. But all things being equal, sure. Mm. Because it's about something much deeper. Right. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's about a subtle relationship between human beings you know, where we kind of recognize ourselves in one another, where we're communicating with one another on a very, very, a really amazing and subtle level. It's just that it's a joy. It can be a joyful experience. I mean, it can be one of the most like awful, <laughs> painful things that you can do, you know, as well. But like that, again, that's part of life. Right. You know, it's, in, it's all inalienable from the experience. It's just imperative to be open to whatever comes at you. My perspective anyway. Thank you. I think it's a good one. Uh, speaking of messed up childhoods, and I don't know if he's had one, but Ozzy Osbourne, uh, <laughs> Osmosis, the 95 record, that one debuted at number four and went platinum. Um, how did you wind up connecting with Ozzy? Um, again, he was an epic artist. Okay. You know, so Richard was like, you know would, would you like to work with this guy and i was like yeah sure you know i grew up listening to his <laughs> who the hell we don't want to work with ozzy osbourne yeah <laughs> man <laughs> all the great music he's made uh i'm almost afraid to ask you to tell me a cool or interesting story about working with him um with him yeah well specifically i mean he he just detested being in the recording studio really yeah, he got very agitated being in recording studios. Um, he would, yeah, he wow. just, he, and it was funny because like when he wasn't recording, I mean, he'd just sit around and tell stories. He was like, a, he could be a very amusing, uh, he could be a very amusing individual to be around. Like sure. he could tell you the same story like nine different times. You know, like your your grandmother or something like that. But each time he'd tell it, <laughs> you would still find yourself laughing at the same things as if you'd heard it for the first time. And you'd be like, I already know this story. Why is this funny? Yeah. Like, this guy's like, he doesn't even know that he's already told me this. And it's still funny. He has just got this, he has this way of being able to tell a story where you're basically on the floor. And he can also make the most horrible thing incredibly amusing. Like he told the story about, about when randy rhodes got killed mm. and there are parts of it where he actually made, you could actually be laughing and, and you'd, you'd be like i don't know why i'm laughing at this i should not laugh right right, now. right. this is really bad <laughs> but wow. 
So he's just a very entertaining he's guy. Incredibly entertaining. But, you know, when he, get in, when he gets in the studio, it's a whole different story. He's just very, very anxious. And we have him on the microphone and he, he couldn't do like a full vocal performance top to bottom. He'd have to do a line, then double it, a line and then double it, you know? So the vocal performances were, I mean, we did it in a way I'd never worked before. Sure. And if he didn't have, if he didn't nail like this double within about two passes, I think we'd have to go back and redo the first one again. So it was, it was pretty oh painstaking. God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I just remember at one point, like we stopped the song for a sec and we thought that he wanted to do something and he thought that we wanted to do something. And we're all just sitting there for about like a minute and there's just silence. And I hear him through the microphone, his, you know, his, his bracelets are tinkling because he's like this all the time, like that. And finally I press the talk back and I'm like, you there, Ozzy? He's like, fucking roll the tape, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny man <laughs> so that took a, that record took a while to make i'm assuming then it took a while to make yeah, yeah. i mean at one point ozzy came in and he was like look i just been to the dentist and he tells me i've got an abscess all the way up my jaw like into my skull so i need to be on meds and this and that and the other and you know because he was having trouble singing and I was like, what's wrong with this guy? Oh, man. Usually when people are, are sick or have some kind of, you know, other impediment, and, and I don't mean like cold stuff, just their bodies run down for some reason. You can, you can tell the minute they start singing, like something's just missing. Presence is gone. The high end goes real quick. And he just got on the mic and it was, he had no control or anything. And he went to the doctor and found out that he was that he was sick. And I was like, all right, well, we can't work, you know. So we wound up not seeing him for about like three or four weeks. Oh wow. And were you able to yeah. do other stuff on the record or the whole thing was just put on pause? Because his vocals were probably coming last, no? Um, I like to try and mix them up if I can. Fortunately, okay. that was a record that had a lot of overdubs. But yeah, there were a couple of days where we were like, Well, we don't have anything to do, so you know, mm -hmm. we would be out. Marilyn Manson, Mechanical Animals, 1998. How did you connect with those guys? Um, well, uh, I was very fortunate because uh, Billy Corgan, who um, also recommended me for Celebrity Skin, recommended that I produce Mechanical Animals. Which went to number uh, one, again, I should have mentioned. Yeah, that. which is very kind of him. And I will never be able to thank him enough for recommending me on both records. Um, so I met with Manson, we hit it off and that was it. That's almost scary. <laughs> he hit it off with Marilyn Manson. Well, I suppose based on, based on recent history and everything else. But... I know, I'm just kidding, but... Uh... <laughs> uh... Give me, tell me a cool story or interesting story about working with them on that project. Um, well, you know, I mean, as you can imagine, there, there are quite a few. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's one of the few records that I, that I did, I think, where there, you know, I mean, there are obviously some significant moments here and there because you're dealing with that kind of personality. But sure. uh, when it was time to get down to business, like all those guys, they just did their job. I mean, it was incredible. Like, I remember seeing videos of them and thinking, my God, I'm going to like, I'm like going into a snake pit here. I don't know what I'm dealing with. These people look like, you know, they just got released from this, you know, from the sanitarium last yeah. week or something. Yeah. You know, and Twiggy, the, you know, the bassist, who also wound up being the guitarist as well. He was one of the best musicians I've ever worked with. I mean, he was just, he, he'd just sit around all day long when he wasn't, when he wasn't actually recording and he'd just like come up with riffs, wow. you know, he was known as the human riff machine. He'd just sit there and each thing, you know, he'd do something and be like, wow, that's really good. So he's just a total <laughs> do something else. He's a total professional. He's a great, incredible musician. You know, he, 
as I said, he played the guitar and the bass on that record. He was just, you know, and he nailed everything. He was yeah, that's so a good. great record, man. Thank great you. record. Re- I mean, it's so well done, man. Uh, and what was the biggest challenge of that project? Um, what's the biggest challenge? I don't know. It was actually, I think it may have been about the quickest record I've, um, the, the quickest large scale record I've ever worked on. It, it was soup to nuts. I think it was like two and a half months. Okay. Um, there, there really weren't that many like major, major challenges on that record. You know, nice. it was, yeah. I mean, once it got rolling, it was, I mean, we did have some get some issues with the other guitarist, Sim, who kind yeah. of magically disappeared a couple of times <laughs> on us. But, uh, you know, again, we had a great guitarist Enjoy. on the project, so we were able to able to address all that. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you about the whole record, but it's been so it's it does so much stuff about it out there. I'm going to I'm going to let that go unless you'd like me to go over it with you. It's really up to you. I don't care. All right, let's go. Whole oh, Courtney Love's Celebrity Skin. Uh, the album had a number one hit single, which was the title track. Again, there's not a bad song on that record. I mean, it's just a great, great record. The album went platinum. Uh, I guess Billy connected you on that, Billy Corgan. Yeah. And uh, what was the vibe that attracted you to that band? Uh, well, I got a demo tape. And I listened to it and I was like, this is actually really good. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a total about face from anything that they'd done previously. It sounded nothing like Live Through This. It sounded nothing like any of their other records. They were trying to make a pop record, pure and simple. Um, but obviously it being them, it had to have an edge to it. It had to, it had to be something more than just a straight pop album. You know, so there's... <laughs> So there's a fist in the glove, so to speak. Right. And uh, that was one of the things that I loved about it as well. There were so many facets to it, actually. It was one of those things where, like, how could I say no to this? It was so good, <clears throat> every aspect. And, you know, plus I'm, I'm hearing her voice on the demos, and I was like, she sounds really good on these songs. Like, her voice sounded marvelous. So and- powerful, man. Her voice was so powerful on that record, man. But she's also got this like there, there's this like upper partial in her voice that it's like it's like a shimmer almost. And when it doubles, um, obviously you get this like really nice chorusing effect that happens. And it was it, it just it's like icing on a cake or something like that. It was so beautiful. I was like, oh, <laughs> it just made me tingle every time I heard it. Now, so when you're listening to demos you, and you're hearing her voice, you're right away going into, okay, we can double this and this will really, or like you're thinking to yourself, once we get this in this proper studio, I can really do something great with this. In some cases, yeah. But I mean, in some cases on the demos, her voice was already doubled. So it was pretty okay. easy to figure out what, to, I mean, obviously, what do you do when you want to kick a chorus up? You double the voice. It's not, right. you know, that, that bit isn't exactly brain surgery. To me, it's more hearing the individual component parts that, that makes up that make up the voice, like recognizing, okay, how is this going? How 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 will I optimize this? You know, like in some cases, I find I have to go to great lengths to be able to get those little bits out of the person's voice. Mm. And that comes down to mic things like microphone and signal chain stuff like that. You know, um, you know, proximity to the microphone itself. Uh, that's interesting. Man, you know, there's a lot of minutia involved. To me, there is. I mean, a lot of people just go in and be like, yeah, let's record these songs. You know, I don't look at it like that. To me, it's like a painting, Yeah. you know? And, you know, and I'm not talking about like, a, <laughs> I, I'm not talking about a, a piece of pop art. You know, to me, it's like a Rembrandt. It's yeah. like you're getting in there. Like, I, I am interested in the way the light is hitting the subject, how the light is, you know, bouncing off one facet of like a diamond earring or something like that you know like with chris for example he did there are little things in his voice that i absolutely love most people are going to put a vocal mic up in front of this guy and call it a day but to me 
all the little elements in his voice are what makes up how great it is. And he does this little thing at the end of, it, of uh, certain phrases where he kind of, he expels a breath, like, oh, like that. Just, because he's taking a lot of air in, and he was this big, strong guy, for, you know, very muscular. So like the act of singing is a very, very kind of, it's a very physical act for him. You know, so you hear this expulsion of breath and I was like, we have to amplify that, make it as loud as possible. So it was all about tweaking it, getting the right mic, you know, getting the compressor to hit him the right way, you know, to really make sure that that element in his voice was audible. Now, if you listen to it, you can even hear him doing those expulsions of breath when there are sections of loud guitar, you know. It's in there so you can actually hear that. And to me, that's one of the sexiest things about his voice because it puts you like this yeah. in that kind of proximity with the singer, which is where I want to be when I listen to a person sing. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really cool. Uh, I'm afraid to ask you, this the celebrity skin, aside from the drummer drama, what was the biggest <laughs> challenge of that project? Um, it was... Well, there were a bunch, really. I mean, it was a, that was a really hard record to make. I mean, keeping, keeping the focus in the project um, was difficult. Um, you know, after doing the drums, like doing bass guitar was, was hard because I wanted to get the, 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 the rhythm tracks to have a certain kind of groove. And Melissa, the bass player, just didn't really have that feel. So I had to manipulate her bass tracks as well as her performance. I mean, to her credit, I have to say, we, we redid her bass on that record about like two or three times before we got it right. And when she came in, like the last time to do it, she had like a headband on, she had like wristbands on. She was like, I'm going to get this. Oh, and I was cool. like, nice. Yeah. You know, so she really, she put her back into it, you know. Um, but we, but I, I worked hard to manipulate the positioning of the bass guitar against the drums to get it to groove a certain way. So the tracks would swing properly, you know? So yeah, that was a lot of work. Great record, man. So such a Thank good you. record. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I read an interview you did and you said something to the context of, it was related to making records, but I thought it was very true about anything you're doing in life. You said when people are afraid, they tend to make poor decisions. Conversely, they also tend to make moves which appears safe in the short term, which is ideal if you're trying to conform to a pre-existing standard, but not so great if you're trying to blaze a trail or just be yourself. And I think we touched on it before, but... Yeah, we did. We did. Can you talk about maybe some of the strategies, and maybe this relates to your book, strategies you've developed so artists or anybody can approach creativity in today's environment without having to conform to standards? Well, the bottom line is either you're going to or you won't. Like, and you can tell within a few seconds if the person that you're dealing with is that kind of person. You know, basically everyone's ruled by fear on some level. You know, the best that you can do is to try and work your, is to try and recognize exactly what it is that scares you and I mean, down at the, at the deepest possible levels, like getting into like, you know, from when you're a little kid, yeah, you know, and what scared you, you know, what aspects of your upbringing put the, you know, basically put this kind of irrational fear into your head and into your body, into your, into your, your emotional state. Um, but the people who are willing to look at their fear and to work through it are the ones who are ultimately going to be able to blaze trails. You know, I mean, there are people I would reckon who are completely unafraid of anything and they're generally the ones who are <laughs> the most successful, right. you know, and there really aren't that many of those people who are able to recognize what it is that terrifies them the most. And I'm not just talking about rats and spiders. Yeah. You know, course, the, inter yeah. The, the stuff that's, in, that's internal, it's like deep set. It challenges every belief system that you have. I mean, generally, it's the things that challenge your belief system that scare you the most, whatever that is. You actually have that conversation with them when you talk and say, hey, what, what's scaring you really? I mean, do you have that with, when you- If with it's some relevant. People? Okay, yeah. To me, it's not, to me, this, what informs the conversation is what's relevant. 
is it relevant at this point in time to get into something that deep? I mean, when someone's basically either out on a limb and in a blind panic, you know, it might be relevant to have that conversation or it might be relevant to kind of say, hey, I'm going to leave you here and you get to you get to find your way off this. Or, hey, I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to stroke your back, you know, and hold you and help you get through this. You know, so there's like a whole bunch of different yeah. ways. The bottom line is sensing what the person needs, you know, being empathic, I guess, and having a sensory awareness of what this person is going to need next um, and being able to offer that up to them, you know, and also giving them the option to kind of say, hey, I would really like you to help me through this, you know, as, yeah. you know, as opposed to just kind of saying, hey, you need my help now. I mean, obviously, if someone's in dire straits, yeah. And you go, hey, I think you need my help now. Yeah. In other cases, it's like, look, I'm here for you if you need me. Right. Yeah. And that's always you know? a tough thing for people to ask for help, you know, to feel vulnerable enough and safe enough, excuse me, to feel safe enough to be vulnerable with somebody. It's terrifying. Yeah. That in itself is terrifying yeah. because it's, it challenges a lot of people's belief systems right there. Right. You know, the belief that I should be able to handle this on my own. I'm strong enough to do this. I don't need another person. Right. You know, I've worked with lots of people who simply won't, right. you know, who, and who will turn that kind of thing away. And it's not because they don't deep down inside really want it. It's because they're too afraid and because it challenges their sense of like, well, if I accept this or if I ask for it, it caves my idea of me being completely self-sufficient and powerful, right. you know, and then I'm deficient to me, like, you know, because there's people who see, who think that way they see in binary terms. It's kind of like, if I have to ask for help, I'm weak. It's no, yeah. it's not like if I have to ask for help, I need help in this moment. Can you help me? Which is the reality. It's the, you know, their belief is if I have to ask for help, I'm weak. Don't you know, it, it, which is a complete, which is a complete fallacy. It's like, no, the, but what you, oftentimes the best thing you can do is ask for help. Yeah, of you course. hired me. And you, you have to ask me. for help. Yeah, you've hired me so you can ask me for help. I am your on call, on hand helper. Yeah. If you right. don't ask me, if you don't ask me for help, you're not getting your money's worth. Right. You know, right. so I suggest you ask me for help, you right. know, but people don't, oftentimes they still don't want to do it because it means they're weak to them. Right. You know, but being able to get past that level of fear. And again, there's so many levels. It's like a video game <laughs> where you're getting yeah. through different levels of yeah, like what yeah. scares you. You know, the most superficial ones are kind of like, well, it's because people in the music industry told me I have to do it like this, you know, because there's always a, there's always a sub level to that right. and then a the level to that. And each successive sub level gets you closer to what the actual fear really is. Right. You have to like peel back all these different layers. In this case, the first one is usually like, if I don't do this, the music industry says that I'm, I'm going to be a failure, you know, I mean, and there's always an answer to that. And the first, the first answer is you expect to make a living doing this. Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> You're not going to make a living doing this. Yeah. You're crazy. You know, cause I couldn't make a living doing what I did. Yeah. The idea that someone who had no training, you know, that, that had no idea what they were doing, basically, you know, basically like fake their way into the process of being a record producer and then happened to find out that it was the one thing that he was actually, that he was actually like best acclimated for. Right, right. You know, so it didn't fake my way into anything. This was sort of like the natural place for me to be. It's like, how can you possibly, if you're able to, to see that and understand the absolute unlikelihood Yet the absolute perfect, per perfection in the same moment of that, if you're able to see that, then surely you can see that the possibility that you can make a living doing this kind of work is completely outlandish and nonsensical. So first of all, get that out of your head. You're not going to make any money doing this. You're probably going to fall on your fucking ass and fail miserably. So if we have agreed to this, this point, which is impossible to disagree with, because how can you prove to me that you're going to be a success? I don't hear anything that's great. Right. You know, I don't hear anything that's on that level. What does it hurt you to do the thing you're best at to the best of your ability, which may sound absolutely nothing like anything's ever anyone's ever heard before. 
But what if it's brilliant? And what if it blows people away? Then yeah. I could be wrong and you may actually have a shot at this. Right, right. Crazy, huh? <laughs> so you really have you so like part of your job is almost to be like like in, in a, a supportive therapist in a way for you, this for my, the project. Yeah. My work project. is basically a lot of my work has basically been untying people so self-imposed head fuckery for lack yeah. of a better way to put it. Right, right. You right. know, you've tied your brain up in knots believing all this nonsense. Let me help you. You know, let me help you with that. That's this is my job. I will, I, you know, I can at least give you a logical, a set of, a set of logical reasons why you should not believe what it is that you believe, even though believing it feels right to you. It internally feels like it's properly oriented. Well, maybe you feel like that because you've convinced yourself, not because it's right, right. because you believe, you have believed, you've bought into something because you wanted to, because you chose it. Not because it's true, not for any other reason, but the fact that you chose it. Right. So, you know, based on some other perhaps wrong preconceived notion that you have. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or preconceived notions that appear right to you. You know, nothing's right. wrong if you don't want it to be wrong. I mean, what's right? What's real for that matter? Right. Very, you very know, good who's, go who's going to be able to prove there's no absolute proof to anything? Yes. You know, yeah. People can tell you there's an absolute proof for stuff. There is, you know, people who are religious, they have taken a, you know, they've made a choice to believe what they believe. And I would not take that away from anyone for any reason. Absolutely. If your belief system interferes with the work that you're doing and the work that you're doing is somehow intertwined with the work that I'm doing, that's a different story yeah. entirely. Yeah. If you've retained me to help you, then my, then my job in part is to help you be able to look at what at the work that you're doing from a completely different perspective. And I can do that from a logical standpoint. I can logically convince you that your perception of what you're doing is actually screwing you up and not getting the best out of you, you know? And the people that are most open to that, I would imagine are the people that have the biggest breakthroughs. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've worked with all kinds of people. And I, I actually, I had a manager who said, no one's waiting for your next record. That was that's, one of the best things I've ever heard great. anyone say. That's and great. you know what's amazing is that there's so few artists that that doesn't apply to. I mean, right. I've even, I, I've had a chance to say that to so many people who are actually at the highest possible level. But at this point in time, no one cares. Right. And the, one of the main reasons for that is that music has been reduced to such a consumer product that no one does care. The consumer wants to be fed. They want to be served. They don't, they're not interested in, in the artistry anymore because it's not in their purview. But if you can create something that inspires them to want to care about what your artistry is, this is a whole different thing. Yes, because there's no skin in the game anymore to even get music. Nah. You, you push, you hold the phone up and you push the button and you got 3 million songs. There's yes. no skin in the game. So it's it, yes. like anything else. What, what's difficult to obtain is, has greater value. Well, what's difficult to obtain at this point is music that actually has some kind of, like some kind of emotional core to it. Yeah. And, and given the fact that people are, are, are mainly consumers now, most people aren't even going to hear it. They're not even going to connect with it. Because their their sensibilities have been sanded down to the point where it's all gone. Yeah. But there are understand. enough people. There are enough people in the world who will. If you create something that has a strong emotional core, and that being the thing inside of you that you need to communicate and get across. If you do that, and you do that as well as you possibly can, there's a good chance that at least one person in the world is going to hear it and they're going to love it. That's all you need. Just that one person who goes to you and say and says, I love what you did. It changed my life. Yeah. That's you it. Go. You have, you've won. You've won. That's all you need. Just the one person. Dude, you got a perfect, you should, you could have been a football coach even. I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, where I, did you, this is what you, I do. <laughs> where did you, so where did you get this work ethic from you? You, you have a very, you know, um, you, you're very, um, what's the word? Personal pride 
in what you do, but where did that drive and work ethic come from? I don't know. It's just, it's just something that came over time. You mm -hmm. know, I have, there's a very strong emotional connection with music and for, you know, for me. Right. And I feel that in order for me to do my best work, I have to feel an emotional connection with what I'm working on. I mean, what's actually a really fun exercise for me now is working on music where I don't have an emotional connection to it at all. And to see if I can be as, I guess efficient and provide the same level of, you know, of, of help to people with their songs as I can, if I'm kind of like, if I'm really dug into something. Deep. Right. And I discovered that it's impossible to actually, to actually separate your own emotional, like your, your own personal feelings from a piece of music. If you start having to analyze it, mm, yeah. or at least for me, like I can't listen to a piece of music that I'm going to analyze and not dig and that not connect with it because i mean because it the thing is it has to speak to you it has to speak to you emotionally it has to connect with you emotionally because that's what music does that's what sure. it is you know so if it doesn't do that for me like i have to be a little infected by you have someone. to be a little invested man yeah yeah I, you have it's to, impossible yeah, it is it's even i'll be honest with you i've had people um asked to come on the show and they've sent me stuff and not listen to 12s. It doesn't happen. I could always find a couple of things I can be attached to, but it's happened a couple of times where I've listened to something and it's like, and I'll have to call up and I, I can't tell them that, but I just, Hey man, it's whatever, because I can't go and say, Hey, you need to go listen to this. I'm lying. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I don't want to listen to it. I'm not going to tell you to it, you know? Sure. So I totally yeah. understand that, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. To whatever extent you're comfortable, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Um, well, I mean, there, there have been, there have been a bunch actually. Um, when I got booted out of material, I kind of, I went into like a serious depression and, you know, cause I, I also discovered that no one knew who I was. Like, even though I had a song that was like this massive hit and I, this is one of the amazing perks from it. Myself and, uh, and my partner, Laswell, like we actually got, but we, we won the uh, Rolling Stone uh, critics poll for producer of the year for rocket. Like 1983. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> you know, 22, 23. Wow. So I go, you know, I start like, uh, hawking my wares, so to speak. And I come, I, I came to find that no one in the music industry actually knew who I was because my former partner had, and his um, and the guy he was working with had created this alternate like reality where I where where it was Bill who did all the work and I hadn't done anything on it so I was kind of like I guess wow. I'm starting over from scratch not to mention the fact that I was suing him you know because of the whole publishing thing um, um yeah that's a lot of so by that's that a lot time, to be depressed about. Yeah. Yeah. By that time, I'm 24 years old. I don't have a penny to my name except these huge BMI checks that come, which I wind up squandering. You know. <laughs> so. <laughs> and you know, so I was just, I, I was just creamed. Like it just felt like everything was caving in on me from all sides. I went from this absolute pinnacle to like the pits, zero to sixty. And it was just wow. getting worse every fucking day. So um, I just, I mean, some days I couldn't get out of bed, but you know, I tried to, I kept calling people at record companies and I just kept working on stuff until I had a meeting with the guy at EMI who was like, I think I, I may have something for you. And he played me that Chili Peppers cassette tape, you know? Wow. Little did either of us know what was going to happen with them, yeah. you know, and that was kind of like the beginning of the road um, out of that, you know, out of all that, wow. you know, I mean, for, for me, it was like, you just have to keep going, you know, and later on, I, I realized that it's not even just keeping going. It's recognizing that the perception of what's going on around you is really interpretive. Yeah. Um, 
no matter how crushing this, the circumstances might be and how many other people might agree and go like, wow, that's crushing. I don't know how I could get through that. It's still a matter of interpretation. There are some people who would deal with the same things and wake up every morning and go like, okay, what do I got to do? You know? <laughs> that's and, a great, great point. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, you choose your interpretation as well as the circumstances, you know, I, you don't necessarily, you know, say, okay, now I want to be miserable, you know, be, be in like a, a situation where people I work with have like fu literally fucked me over in business, you know, and I can't work because of it. You know, you may, you may not necessarily choose that, but if it comes at you, you go like, you know, you can be like, I can't get out of bed. This, I can't right. take this or, or you're like, all right, what am I going to do today? Right. It's right. time to get time to get rolling. Time to do something. I don't know what it is, but you know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> it's hard though when you're 23, you don't have that coping skill. I didn't have any I didn't have any coping yeah. skills at so, all. Right. You're so right about that cuz every day some you could say it's how you handle stuff. You know, what is that expression life is 90% uh or, perspiration and 10 percent inspiration yes. yeah it's you know it's how you handle things not what the thing is yeah. that determines the outcome but you could go a step further and go like this adversity is here for me to triumph over and to triumph through right how am i going to do this like i've actually worked with people since include you know this guy dean the drummer that i work with being Castanova. one of them who i've yeah. Who, yeah who i've seen do this twice like where he was you know, on this Ozzy record, because I was close to getting someone else in. And I even told him this, you know, he came back, like I've seen him come back from situations like that literally the next day where he kind of thought it through. I don't know what he did. You know, he may have gone home and talked to Jesus for all I know. Yeah. He came back, he'd come back in the next day, he'd sit down at the drums and I'd be like, this is a whole new person. This is not the person I spoke to last. This is the person I've wanted to see show up the entire time. I love you. Yeah, you're my, you're my God right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whip it out, brother. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and you know, we have every person has the power inside of us to be able to change that perspective, no matter how egregious it is, you know. And it's again, it's just so tough being able to fight through those belief systems. You know, the things that we feel kind of make up who, who exactly we are. But it's amazing once you find yourself on the other side. It can happen in a split second or it can happen over the course of, you know, decades. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're kind of like, I really thought that way. Yeah. Oh, wow. What would I, what was I on? If I'd known it was different on this side, I would have been here a long time ago. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. Just the same as Mike Ness going like, that's what you wanted? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I would have, yeah, if I knew, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. You I know. remember I was with a buddy of mine years ago, and I, I used to, I bit my nails terribly for most of my life from like five. And I stopped biting my nails one day and I was uh, out with him and his wife. And I mentioned it. She goes, you know, Craig, it takes a lifetime to do something and it takes a second to do something. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what you're talking yep. about, you know, it's like, it, it's up to you, man. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying, I'm open to this. I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm open to something changing, yes. you know, and just saying it over and over again, going like, I don't know how it's, what it is. You know, I, my, my perspective is too limited at this point to even understand it. My range may be too limited, but I'm open to see it changing and I'm open to participating in that. And you know what? It may sound like pretty words, but you have no idea the power of words. You know, they just they 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 completely they they dictate your perspective on everything. Absolutely, I'm in 100% agreement with you there, man. It's very important, and, and I literally sometimes will say stuff out loud, like I'll talk with myself. You know, when I go on a walk or when I'm in the shower or something, like to. Hey, Craig, you need to get off your ass and do this or oh, whatever. Yeah, or you need to be absolutely. open to do it, you know, and you're hundred yeah. percent right, man. Yeah. Well, I do the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, favorite musicians you've enjoyed working with. <laughs> Most of them, I think, I mean, yeah. like it's 
every project has, you know, has great performers on them and I've enjoyed them all, you know, in different ways for different reasons. Tell me your uh, top three desert Island discs. Oh, that's impossible. I would, I, I would, I'd just have for, to just for this moment, just, just for this moment. I don't, I don't have, I can't do it. It's impossible. People ask me this question. I'm like, no, you're going to have to drown me then. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm in the ocean. I'm not on the Island anymore. <laughs> there's, never... it, there's just too many. There's too many good records. I mean, great records. I can't, you know, it's like, it hurts me. Like I had to clear space on my, <clears throat> on my computer because I just, I don't have enough room to, you know, to have like to, to be running programs and stuff that I need. Yeah. Cause it's just, it's just saturated with, with music and I won't put anything on my computer. That's in less than AIFF um, okay. form. I won't even listen. I, I don't even like wave files. Yeah. You know, so, so lossless audio for me is a no, no. Like I, I, I don't like lossless files. I mean, most people are like, you can't hear the difference. And it's like, Oh, I can. <laughs> so you, you must have massive drives to support. I mean, what do you, I mean, I can't, yeah. I can't listen. I, basically if i play if you play music off a off an external drive it's running on a different bus it's running to a different bus mm -hmm. than um than stuff that's directly on the computer drive right. so it changes the the stream of audio of of uh, of data and that affects the sound quality and i can't oh so if i'm listening God. to music it's got to be on the draw it's got to be on the disc or i'm not having it um but see the thing is that I, I've got this like ridiculous playback system now. You know, that's how I work. I don't work. I don't use DAWs anymore. Like I'm basically in, in stereo world until I have to be in like surround world. Uh, and eventually my playback system is going to be a streaming device. Be like a network that's got like a hard drive that's got like, you know, all my, all my music on it completely. Like a, a dedicated music, music supercomputer that's unlike an all purpose computer. It doesn't right. have any other like it doesn't have any other functions running in the background. Just to play music. It exists just to yeah. play music. Yeah, I get that. Better. Exactly. But like I, you know, but you can hear the thing is you can hear these things. It's not like you've got like you've got crazy. It's just like, no, no. If I well, if I sit you them. down, if yeah, but if I sit you down and I show you the difference between a MacBook Pro, which is what I have. Right. And then you take the power cable out of the MacBook Pro and just listen to the music with the battery and not the not the AC. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear a difference. And okay. then, like, I actually got a Mac Mini because I don't want to get like a big Mac Power because I don't need that. That's what I got. Um, They're great, aren't they? Well, I got I, I, I had to I had to send the second one back because they both malfunctioned on me. I don't know. Did they keep restarting? Randomly restart? No. Um, I just I had other problems with it, like. Both of them, they just like, anyway, but the sound quality, the difference in sound quality between the Mac mini and the MacBook Pro was like, I mean, it actually saddened me to send the mini back because yeah. it sounded so much better than the MacBook Pro. And it's like, people say, oh, computers, you know, it's all digital audio. And I mean, it's like, if you say that you haven't done an AB, you haven't actually right. sat there and listened to the difference because if you did, you wouldn't say things like that anymore. You would say, I don't understand why in physics or science there's a difference, but there's a difference and there's a big difference. So can you tell me one record you'd put on your Desert Island disc list? Um, I can tell you one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, God. <laughs> See, <laughs> just... Just for this second, just for this. The, the, I, 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 have a, I have a mental illness, so um, <laughs> I have to, my ADHD is kicking in here. Oh, is it? So you're like, you can't get, you, you know, it's funny. I'll never forget. Somebody sent me in an email one day and said, I love listening to your show. And the thing that I enjoy the most is how people will open up and tell you about, you know, divorce, death, bankruptcy, addiction. But when you ask them for their three favorite records, they shut up and it's like they're, they can't speak. It's like someone's choking them. It's so funny. Oh, so you've this, seen this movie before. Huh? Oh, this is everybody's like this. Well, especially <laughs> uh, you didn't look at the questions ahead of time. Some people know it's so they're at least like, OK, for that one, they may write it down because it's like it's a, you know, it's a ridiculously hard question. 
Right. Yeah. It's not, I mean, this, this, what am I even listening to this week? Yeah. I mean, what do you, what's on so much? Um, what's the last thing you listened to? Tell me that. Um, it was probably a touch too much by ACDC. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's great. <laughs> that's become, but that's only be, that's because, um, I played it for my son and he became like an ACD. My son's three. So he's <laughs> like, he, um, but on this system, like the last thing I listened to in the car was probably numbers by Kraftwerk. Oh, okay. Now he's like a now he's a big Kraftwerk fan too. Um, what do I? I mean, shit. I'll listen to anything from Georgi Ligeti to like Eno to Stockhausen to you know old blues records. To, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's just it's all over the place. You know, Led Zeppelin four. <laughs> right. Right. I read, I saw this on, I think your social media profile per Adua ad Astra. It says, yeah. and, I, and I looked that up. It says through adversity to the stars. And it's the official motto of a bunch of Royal air forces throughout the world. I was just curious what yeah. the significance of that was to you. Uh, well, <laughs> I feel to some extent I may have laid it out already, but you know, I think, you know, it's, it's like what we were saying before about the, you know, about, turning carbon into the into a diamond or something yeah. like that it's like you you know you you put effort into the things that you do and you achieve greatness that way mm. it's the it's the most simple formula in the world to make something that's amazing yeah happen i mean people kind of keep asking if hey, but how'd you do this and how'd you do that and it's like i worked my ass off yeah i worked my ass I mean, off that's yeah how much how much harder does it need to be i worked extremely hard you know and I worked hard on other things before that. And that fueled my experience, which in turn gave me the tools to be able to make, excuse me, determinations about certain things, like creative decisions, knowing how to help people, you know, having a <laughs> sense ahead of time, what microphone to use on this artist, you know, things like that. Uh, I know you are a guy who's probably hard on himself, demanding. Have you found over the years that you've let yourself off the hook as far as intensity of work, suffering is not necessary? Like there's a difference between working hard and, and suffering. Suffering is easy when you're in your 20s and 30s. You know, what there I mean? you go, man. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's when, but that's the time that you're supposed to be doing it. Right. You know, right. I mean, to me, the intensity of, of self-application it, it never it, it if it if, you, if it lets up if you if you use this excuse of like yeah well, i'm older now i don't have to do that or I, I don't feel like doing that it's like you basically sold yourself short and you've made an excuse to yourself it's like i don't give a shit how old i am right like that's irrelevant to me i've got a fucking three-year-old son you right. know i mean i'm 61 right like you know, I don't have, I don't have time to make excuses like that. Right. If you, if you want to give up now, give up now. <laughs> but know? suffering, but there is a difference between intensity and suffering. Like, I don't know. I found the management of my intensity is different now. Like I used to think I've got to suffer, not just in work and everything. I, you know, I had to feel sore after every workout and I've come yeah. and I've realized what's more important is consistency and you can back off on oh and you know what it is too maybe not being as attached to the outcome um that's helped me a that's lot. a that's something that you gotta you have to train yourself in pretty hard that's, a, that's always really tough. fucking hard to do that yeah i mean suffering is sitting and listening to the same piece of music for hours and hours <laughs> and hours and and just and just like driving yourself you know, past the point of, you know, when you needed to eat, when you needed to go to bed, when you need to go to the bathroom, you know, just kind of like pushing and pushing, like, I got to crack this, I got to crack this, you know, as opposed yeah. to, as opposed to, you know, do, listening at the same level to a piece of music and saying, okay, like, I got an, like, I, I've been at this for an hour, I, I got to get up, get some air, I'm going to walk around a little bit. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Being more fair to yourself. Yeah. But you, the thing is, is that this is the point where experience and also understanding yourself kicks in. Yeah. You know, 
I'm not going to let myself off the hook because I'm older, but at the same time, like, I know my body can only take so much. Like, yeah, just treat it being gonna, kinder. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to sit down at a cross training thing in the gym, you know, and try and knock off like a thousand calories the way I used to do in the gym. Like, <laughs> right. you know, competing with this guy next to me who's like six five or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yoked. You know, being like, you think you can fucking do this? Watch me, motherfucker. You yeah, know? yeah. Right, right. No, that's <laughs> it, being kinder. You know, now yourself. it's yeah, it's it's like. Well, and it's also like, how am I being the most efficient? Because when you start looking at the suffering part of it, you start to go, well, maybe I wasn't being efficient. Maybe it yes. wasn't so efficient to like bang my head against the wall because ultimately I didn't get the results I was after anyway. And I was just sore and I hurt myself. I beat myself up and I, st- and I just, I just, you know, played into this be- old belief system I had. You know, and that goes back to belief systems, you know, and, and head fucking, you know, <laughs> it doesn't everything that, I mean, go back. Doesn't everything go back to that? <laughs> ultimately. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you can see it either as a nightmarish thing, or you can look at it and go, ha, 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 I can't believe I did that. Like, right. that's just so ridiculous. Yeah. You know, if you're able to look at it from a logical standpoint and divorce yourself from the emotional tie, just be like, all right. I did it. It was silly. What am I going to learn from this? And did I really learn? Yeah. Did I really learn? Don't do this anymore. You know, best decision you ever made. (laughs) Again, too many to, too many to to note, but um, two of my favorites are probably um, getting uh, getting married to my my my, my wife, um, adopting my daughter, and having uh, and and having my son. <laughs> nice man. Three, yeah, those three. Um, you know, cool. as far as the as far as work oriented stuff, like you know, just I guess just being available when the opportunity arose. Man, listening to that. Uh, what was that record you mentioned? Listening to that Walter Carlos record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was happenstance, you know? Yeah. I mean, the fact that my grandparents had this record. Yeah. And I, and I pulled it out and I was like, what is this? Yeah. It's funny how that works, man. Uh, it, tough, it is. Tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Me? Yes. Um, well, um, I enjoy the way my mind goes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a shame when it's gone, but I won't miss it since I won't know. <laughs> <laughs> won't miss it since I won't know. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Although I'm starting to lose it now. So <laughs> no, it's like I'm... <laughs> it's age, man. You start re- telling the same stories like a couple of times. Oh, gosh. I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to drive the wrong way up one way streets. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, that's see oh my god <laughs> oh <laughs> um, <laughs> i mean you know i i think the idea of being of, of becoming more flexible with age as opposed to becoming entrenched in one's beliefs you know and allowing for the possibility that change is is real and change is inherent and change is all right and going with that flow you know just being like okay i'm not going to get stuck in this belief system and allow and and for let it kind of like dig you know basically stake me into the ground like especially in the world that we're living in right now where so much is changing yeah man you know having the i having the wherewithal to move up here right from you know from where i was of course we just went to this area was um over the weekend the hottest place in the entire world (laughs) yeah i was wondering if you're getting hit with some of that uh fortunately we didn't have it as bad as certain parts but it was like 110 up here fuck that's hot that's hot man that was insane and it's and this isn't like dry heat either this is like oh it's humid 
this is a rainforest. I mean, Victoria, Vancouver oh. Island is a, is basically a rainforest. And it wasn't like it wasn't like you know blindingly humid or anything like that, but it was like it's not it's not dry heat. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. here it's like 90 and humid, but 110 and humid. I couldn't oh fuck. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're 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 looking at more of that to come. I hope not, man. But yeah, I hate to say it. Oh, uh, it is. It is. Best childhood memory. Um watch Bugs Bunny. <laughs> I love Bugs Bunny, man. That was awesome. Bugs Bunny ruled. Rules. Who who had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Um, I mean, it's variable, I guess. I mean, everyone in my family loves music. So my folks did, you know, um, they were constantly playing music in the house. And uh, my mom's great aunt did as well. She was a, she was an Indian classical dancer um, and not Native American. I mean, like East Indian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she actually gave up a, a career in law to study under a guru in East India um, wow. to learn Indian classical dance. Yeah. And uh, that's commitment. You know, so I, yeah, it's commitment. All right. Well, she, you know, she did what she wanted to do. And uh, yeah, I mean, everyone around me growing up really loved music. So that really, that really kind of, that pushed, that pushed on me hard. And same thing personally biggest influence on you um well, that's a tough one um i mean yeah to a great extent my folks um i had a sixth grade teacher who was a big influence on me too no that's you know? cool i hear that once in a while that's really like it's great yeah she was uh she was definitely sort of like before her time in, in terms of like you know, in, in, in terms of, I guess, empowering kids and making them feel that they were more than their, the product of their environment or the product of their families and stuff. And I mean, she didn't do it in a very over, you know, very explicit kind of way. It was more implied than anything else, but it had a big influence on me. That's great, man. And this in Forest Hills? Yeah, that's right. Here's one. Has your life been different than what you imagined? I never imagined what it was going to be. <laughs> you know Actually, what? I didn't imagine it. I didn't, I did imagine it. Um, and no, <laughs> actually, no, uh, the, the, the impression of it is about the same. That's the amazing. imagery of it is different, but no, I, I, from when I was little, I, I, I imagined a lot of this stuff. I just didn't really understand what it was because I had no place to put it. Sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of what I, a lot of what I've done um, creatively. Yeah. And that's awesome. Uh, funny thing. Uh, where's, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Um, you got a three-year-old kid. Dad? You, well, yeah. You, I was going to say, you don't have too much time for hobbies, man. That's about it. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that, that covers, that covers all the bases right there. Uh, just a couple of questions left. Toughest decision you've ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do. <sighs> wow. There's a lot of those. Um, getting divorced the first time was very hard, but it was basically for my daughter. It wasn't about like, it wasn't about leaving the marriage. Yeah, that was a, that was a tough one. Um, let's see. Uh, moving up here was it was tough to do, but it was a pretty easy decision to make. Sure. Um, I don't know. Um, I think most of them have been like small decisions along the way, just kind right. of dealing with things that were based on a faulty belief system again like it keeps going back to that thing yeah dealing with that kind of stuff dealing with things that were basically clouding my judgment and and pushing my way through them going like you know basically recognizing 
that my resistance came from adherence to a faulty belief system that was, wasn't serving me at that point. And that I either had to kind of like live with my, with my own um, delusion or find a way to get through it somehow, you know, and to kind of surrender to the fact that my perception at that point was, was based on a fallacy. Again, if you're comfortable, that's hard answering this a lot of the stuff you talk about is like very sort of 12 step are you a guy who's gotten sober or went through a 12 step program no interesting no i mean i i think i have an addictive personality but i've never found myself getting addicted to drugs or anything like that i mean i could imbibe with the best of them i would say but but like it's not anything where i ever developed like a problem with yeah. um with abuse with substance abuse per se sure i was just curious because the faulty belief system that isn't serving you that's a very big underlying theme of a lot of 12 step programs you know uh whether it's faulty yeah. beliefs from your childhood or from whatever but then and, and and it's so it's so accurate it fucks a lot of us up at times in our lives and it doesn't serve us at all what look you know my my realization has been that anytime you have you feel bad about yourself in any way or have a bad feeling you're operating under the auspice of a faulty belief system that's all there is there's no reason for anyone to feel bad about anything you know there just isn't if you've murdered somebody you know i'm sure that you know hopefully you can find a reason to justify it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if not then you're a psychopath you yeah, know yeah. um but we've all done questionable things sure some of us have even done absolutely horrible things sure but there's no reason to let that stay with you I mean, unless you actually have to repent for something that you've done, unless you have to, you know, unless you have to be in a prison and just kind of deal with, mm. the, you know, the fruits of your actions, so to speak. There's no reason for people. And we tend to, people tend to feel bad about the most mundane shit 24 <laughs> fucking hours a day. You even dream about it. Yeah. You know, well, that's the thing. The it's it's not based- murder that most people that you're no. fucked up about. It's like you just have this faulty belief system because somebody told yeah. you something 30 years ago. Yeah. And you decided not only to not only to buy into it, you decided to make make sure that it stayed part of you, that you nailed it to yourself and welded right. it to yourself right. so that it would just that you would never, ever forget this sense of worthlessness yeah. or feeling shitty. But it's like, what's it doing there? You know, once you once you face it, it's like, what's it doing there? How's it serving you? You know, ask yourself the question, like, come on, is it really helping you? Does it make does it help you? You know, some people think that they need to feel kind of like lesser so that they don't get an inflated sense of self. And it's like, what the hell is that about? Right. Where did that come from? Who told you that you had an inflated sense of self anyway? Yeah. Why do you think this? Because someone, in order for you to think that way, someone had to say the words. You don't just kind of like get that out of the ether. That came to you from somewhere else. Where did it come from? Who said it? It was a parent, right? Okay. If it was a parent then you know that you are basically being fed a line. And right. it, was a, it was a line that got fed to them too at some point down the road. So basically you're, ba- you're picking up and carrying, you're, you're toting a barge that someone gave to you that was given to them, that was given to them and so on and so on. It doesn't even relate to anything in your reality. So right. what the hell are you doing? You yeah, know, man. and it's interfering with, with, it's interfering with the best of you. So like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you ever regret not pursuing medical illustration? No. Nope. <laughs> last question, man. The biggest change in your personality, Michael, over the last 10 years, and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a part of aging? Um, I, you mean like gray hair and stuff? No, changing <laughs> your personality. I know. Um, I just hey. think... <laughs> talk about hair to me let me tell you fair enough <laughs> uh, better gray than bald michael <laughs> yeah hey you wear it well well thanks uh not everyone can um i you know i, I think that, that a, a con- coming out of a, another particularly bad period of my life um into the past 10 years it's just been like a like a um a spontaneous 
period of growth that hasn't stopped, you know, and I don't plan on letting it stop. You know, I just plan on letting it run its course because now I feel like I'm in flow with life instead of being in this kind of, in this hamster, this gerbil wheel of like, you know, a feeling bad and kind of like being an emotional, <laughs> just, you know, a kind of like shut away or whatever, you know, and just being open to the possibilities that life has to offer and just seeing what life, what comes to you just by being open to it. I mean, that's been an incredible experience and it, and so much will, will happen just by having that one thought and being earnest and being like, okay, bring it on, whatever it has to be. Uh, thank you, man. I want to talk about, I want to tell people, I want to talk about your book because I think it could help a lot of people listening to this. Uh, it's called Unlocking Creativity, A Producer's Guide to Making Music and Art. Um, and it's not only Michael's doing a lot of work, not just in the music arena now, but in other arenas, because the book is has a lot of relevance. So if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Uh, well, I mean, the book really started from, I, I kind of, I, I started to realize that I had over the course of my career to sort of develop certain protocols about working that I hadn't really, there were a lot of them and a lot of them pertain to just to, to technical stuff. And a couple of them were about working with artists and things like that, like do's and don'ts type things. I started, I was like, well, I should just write this down, you know, just so that I've got it. And then all of a sudden this list became 30 pages worth of stuff. And it went into a lot more than just technical stuff. A lot of it was beginning to touch on interpersonal things, you know, and then the 30 pages turned into a hundred pages and then it got more and more. And I began to realize what was happening. And it took me back to artists, most of whom work in the visual field who have manifestos, I guess, you know, where they kind of describe what it is that they're doing and what the intent is behind it. And I realized that throughout pop music, there have been almost no people, especially not from the production side of things, who really discussed what it is that they're doing and why they do it. That very true, man. Yeah, that are that are kind of that it, that are saying that are kind of explaining and defining their intent behind the work that they do behind their actions. And um, I started to realize the relevance and the importance of something like that. People in pop music, they don't take themselves very seriously. That's the bottom line. You know, we who work in pop music have been treated by society as if what we do is kind of a, a an unimportant kind of side, like a marginalized kind of like side note because it's pop, you know, pop culture has no real value. It has no real relevance to what's going on in the world. Unless you dig deep into it, you start to see the importance yeah. of pop culture, of contemporary culture, because that's what pop culture is. And then you start to think, well, wait a sec, if that's the truth, then everything, things that we consider to be classical art were popular art at one time. Correct. What was Mozart in his heyday? Right. He was a popular artist. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you read about how people, how people saw Mozart in his day, you know, how, um, what was it? Uh, the opera? Um, I think when, when, I think he first performed the magic flute in Vienna, like one of the critics said something like, we've never seen music of this like before. Like they were just like, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking they're about blown it. away. They, they're, they're like in history, we've never seen anything like this before. Right. You know, the last opera he did. Oh, I'm trying to remember now if that was the magic flute, whatever the last opera that he did, it actually kept running for 10 years. Like he, he died not long after it premiered. It, mm -hmm. it ran for like 10 years in Vienna for like sold out audiences. Wow. For, 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 for 10 years, like, he was beloved 
of a man of his time. He was not making high art for people. It's high art now yeah, in hindsight. In, con in, in a different, taken out of its original context and put in a new context, it's now high art. But it wasn't high art then. This is music. I mean, it was everyone pop. can see this. This was, yeah, this was music of the people for the people. Like you had people at every strata of society going to see his operas. And see, that's people really, loved them. That, what a great perspective, man. I never thought about that. Well, but then you look at music that people make now. I mean, and we consider stuff like Chuck Berry to be classic, but even now, even though it's classic, people still look down upon it because it's, because it's pop music, because it's a right. pop art form. It doesn't have that kind of relevance. I mean, people, the one thing that people don't talk about is the fact that it was done by a black artist and we can't take black people in this culture seriously for anything, you know, even though their, their, their contribution to this culture is, I mean, you and I can't sit here. I mean, we, we you know, we, there's not enough time left on this earth right. to be able to describe the kind of Im impact that black people have had on American culture. I mean, they, it, it wouldn't be what it, it you know, come on. Right. <laughs> Especially you, look you at know, musically. I mean, music, we wouldn't even, I mean, I don't know that pop music could exist period. Right. Let alone in its current form without the influence of black music. We wouldn't right. know we wouldn't know what a groove is for God's sake. I mean, if you listen, to, no, but if you listen to African music and the influence that it's had on European music and European yeah. folk music forms, and by the way, in music, in European folk music forms, there can, there are grooves. Like there is a natural sense of flow in European folk music as well, but it's not the same as African music and African based music. You know, if you listen to Asian music, there's groove as well, but it's a whole different thing. Yeah. The emphasis is different. There isn't the same kind of fluidity that there is in African music. It's amazing the kind of impact that African music has had on every kind, every form of music around the world. It's just incredible. You know, so like, you know, we, we, we forget about all this stuff and we look at that the that influence and we don't take it seriously you know i mean what was what was r b it was called race music in the 40s and 50s you know it, it it's been all this you know all this great music that is at the at the basis of you know the of the the, the crap music that like your kid plays on on the stair on yeah. you know on in, the, in their car right now with the auto tune still it all it all stems from this one source you know and it's so important and people still don't take it seriously. They don't realize how, you know, how valuable it all is, you know? So to have people thinking, why am I doing this? You know, unfortunately, I don't think that people who are making music now even have the sensibility to apply to this because it's so irrelevant. Since again, music has been commoditized so much. Well, it's again, not no skin in the game to create the music. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. a writer wrote this for you and the writer was basically using words that they felt like, a you know, an audience would respond to because they pulled a whole bunch of people and these words are the words of the week or something like that. Right. You know, or they could run a Google record. AB, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's which all, is a better it's headline, all, which is a better title, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's all done by committee and it's all done by kind of like what gets the highest data reading. Yeah. You know, but to have and this is all that's another reason why i think it's important now for people to realize that there actually is a mindset behind it that there actually is a way of of looking at stuff behind the creation of of, of music and behind in my case the production of music and that's what i wanted to get across you know i mean i was reading books by guys like matisse and um oh what's this artist thing um I can't remember guys like Kandinsky and and um, and um, Paul Clay who've written these manifestos and of course there's the Futurist manifesto by a guy named F T Marinetti who is who is the spokesman for the Italian Futurist in the early part of the 20th century like these guys talked about what their ideas were and it may it means that you can go back to the moment of their inception and go this is what they were thinking about this is so cool.
you know, to be able to provide like a trail of breadcrumbs for people and for people who are aspiring to music production and music creation to see that there can be more to it than just going like, oh, you know, I'm going to write a song and then I'm going to have like a, you know, perfume like named after me and a line of fur coats and stuff like that. And I'll <laughs> retire to an island someplace. It's like, okay, well, you know, if you want to do it, sure. But there are, lots, there are other people who feel differently, you know, who'd like to know that there's actually like a lineage to it and a sense of like, you know, a sense of purpose behind it. So that's really where this book came from. And, you know, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, there's actually the, the elements that, 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 that fuel an approach to music production that go beyond technique, go into philosophical ideas, you know, ideas that are more abstract. And once you're in that territory, you're talking about things that can influence people in every kind of medium and going outside of the, out of art as well. I mean, I've had people who are in finance who've come to me and said, I read your book. It changed my life, you know, so like. Can you give me an example of that? In, in what's, you mean an example of something in, that's kind like of. Like something that has influenced someone's creativity that's in or not in music. I'd just be curious. Um, just the, the somatic connection that you have with your emotional states, you know, having that, you know, having that understanding that, you know, you actually have the, the, the feelings are there for you to kind of like to use accordingly. Not, they don't, they aren't necessarily that it, you know, again, this is a matter of perception for some people you're used by your feelings, you know, you're kind of on a ride with them. Like how you feel is you know, deter it, it determines how you re respond to the world. But you can also turn the tables and say, how I'm feeling is telling me a story. It's telling, it's actually, it's, it's telling me something about something. It's not telling, it's not telling me how to act. You know, it's not yeah. telling me you need to, you need to, re re you don't have to be reactive. Just listen, you know, listen to what this is telling you. Okay. So a lot of the, in a lot of what's in your book is kind of like stuff we talked about today. Some of it. I mean, it's not, it's not all, but, but a like, like a, 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 the basis of it, as far as, you know, feelings and, you know, reacting, not reacting or not reacting and just getting in touch with them and having that guide you to some extent, one way or another with your intuition. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. I want to, so where do you best serve people both in mus musically? And now I know you're doing work outside of musically. And, you know, I know you're doing pre-production, remote production, all aspects of recording process outside of mixing. Um, how do you best, like, wh who do you work best with? Like, who can you help the most again in and out of business? Because I want to get, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, put this out there. So, because you have a lot of stuff to offer and I want people to tap into that who can use it. Thanks. Um, it's, you know, basically people who are ready to kind of take, take a next step in the work that they do. I mean, a lot of people write songs, they record them, they're happy with what they do. They don't need a guy like me. Right. You know, they don't need that kind of, they don't need that, that, that kind of input because they're pleased with where they're at. You know, if you're satisfied, would you, do you need someone to help make you more satisfied? Right, right. <laughs> I think satisfied is kind of like a steady state and there's no like more or less satisfied. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of like a. I'm satisfied or I'm not satisfied. Now, if you're not satisfied, that means that you see that there's a, that there's a place that's further ahead that you can take what you're doing, whatever that might happen to be. Okay. That's if you're right. in a field of endeavor, there's a certain point where you need a hand where you can use someone else's input. You right. know, that's where I step in. I can use songwriting as an analogy because that's what I spend most of my time doing, pulling apart people's songs, you know, and it's all basic stuff, stuff that's kind of, in, that's, that's impeding the, the, the flow of a song that's heating, that that's hindering the, um, the, the dynamics of a song. This, you know, if there's a point in the song for me where I stop listening to it, that means something just happened that, that, that unfocused yeah. my attention, that, that pushed me away from it. And if that's happening, why is it happening? 
So my job is to then dive into it and figure out why I just got knocked off the track, you know? Okay. So let me just summarize this if I can, for people listening. If first of all, if you're in the music business and you're stuck basically with any part of your creative or production process, um, Michael can probably help you. If you're not in the music business and you're stuck or don't understand why you can't move forward with something, and especially if it's something related to creativity, Michael can help you. Is that a fair? Is that a good sales I pitch? I think for you? that's okay. That's a wonderful <laughs> sales pitch. And Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. And uh, the best way to get a hold of Michael's couple of ways. Uh, his website is Michael Beinhorn, B E I N H O R N dot com. Uh, and if you, uh, he's got another website being developed, be out a little bit, but bookmark this beinhorn.ca, B E I N H O R N.ca. And he's got, I'm assuming, got contact forms on there or whatever you, people can reach there's out. There's a contact to. form on, on Michael Beinhorn. Yeah. There's also another um, uh, Beinhorn creative at outlook.com, which kind of gets, which kind of gets directly to my uh, front office, as it were. Great. So hit him up that way. Obviously, tell him what you're doing, why you think you need his help. If you're in music, send him a link so he can get a feel for what, you know, is this in his wheelhouse or whatever. Um, and of course, be respectful. And I, nobody's I've never heard anything bad about anybody listening to this. So I don't think that'll be a problem. <laughs> I haven't because, you know, you hear bad shit right away. You know, I've never, but I haven't. Uh, man, uh, you're the smartest GED holder I've ever met. Oh, wow. That's awfully kind of you. <laughs> no, man, you're the, like, I was, I was, the flock of GED holders you <laughs> out of the population of GED. Uh, man, I want to thank you so much for everything. I really, really appreciate your time. You're really generous, really open and very kind. And that was really nice of you. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I learned a lot. That's my pleasure. I'm glad. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, hang on. Any final words of wisdom? Um, I think you've, I think you've, you've coaxed them all out of me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm man. at a loss now. <laughs> uh, thanks again. Every, uh, hang on one second. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. Thanks very much to Michael Beinhorn. Again, uh, michaelbeinhorn.com and uh, beinhorn.ca. Bookmark that. It'll be coming. Uh, and if you're looking for help with getting, if you're stuck creatively, he's a guy you should probably speak with. Uh, and most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I am out. Michael, thank you for everything, brother. Take care. Thank you.